Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Uh, welcome to this fun Fellowship Friday night. And I apologize to the congregation. Uh, we here in the panel, we we already started having fun even before we went live. So uh, I'm sorry you weren't included in that portion of Fun Fellowship Friday, but we're ready to get started. So let's say hello to everybody. Uh, let's start, uh, start with Sister Jen. Okay, I started talking and it was muted. Hey, guys. It is lovely to be here this evening with you guys, with Ben, Brother Luke, and and Crips, and um, everybody in the chat. Oh, and somebody else just popped on. But great to see everybody this evening. Glad to be here. Uh-oh, you're muted. <laughs> you said someone just popped in. I, I don't see them. I don't. Uh, okay, let's go to the next. Uh, Brother Crips. Yes, you were saying we were having fun before the show. You should uh, do the same thing you did for us off air about uh, finding Diet Mountain Dew. You, you should Yahoo or whatever it was that you did. That was hilarious. Yeah, people Yahoo! Awesome. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Uh, hello to everybody. It's uh, another Friday and looking forward to tonight's broadcast. And um, I hope everyone else can make it. Um, uh, Sister Lisa popped in and then popped back up. She'll be back, so that's good. Glad to, glad to know that she'll be on the way, but we have uh, a good panel tonight. And so hello to everyone in the chat, and look forward to a fun Fellowship Friday. Yeah. All right. Thank you, brother. All right, Brother Ben, uh, say hello to everybody and uh, explain uh, with, about Lisa and Angel. Uh, give everybody an update on that, okay? Sure. Yes, it's good to be here. I'm looking forward to the uh, questions and the fellowship. Um, Lisa said that she uh, was having internet connection issues, but I just saw her drop in and out. Uh, that's pretty typical uh, before she uh, arrives. So hopefully she'll be able to make it. And then Angel um, said that she may or may not be able to make it based on because her uh, just because of life issues. And uh, but if she does make it, uh, don't be surprised. You might not recognize her at first. <laughs> Why is that? What do you mean? We want she, she, has new, she has a new profile picture. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, who is this stranger? I figured that's what you meant. <laughs> that's, that's interesting because uh, I have always found that picture of her fascinating. Uh, uh, I think I did see one picture of her apart from that. So that is at her actual likeness. But uh, I'm, now you got me real curious and interested yeah. in, the, in the new one. So. Uh, I'm hopeful that someday everybody will actually show their faces and put the cameras <laughs> on. Uh, but so <laughs> maybe you want to remain mysterious. Uh, there, I don't blame people for wanting to be as kind of uh, uh, anonymous as possible because of the, the problems on the internet. But uh, I, I do think it is helpful to communicate, to have audio, video, facial expressions, everything. All these things are part of communication. All right, then. Um, let's uh, look at the chat room and see who's in there. Hello, everybody. Um, ben, how are we doing on uh, uh, true false statements tonight? We have plenty? Uh, yes, we do have plenty. Um, yes, we do. So we're good for tonight. Um, but we, could, we, we are, we are uh, running low again, so we could always use more. Um, so that, that would be yeah. great. All uh, right. Heather, Heather's come through in a big way. I want to recognize her for that, and um, and anyone else you can you can also uh, be in the Hall of Fame. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, uh, thank you, uh, Chris Annie L. Uh, she says not everyone has an office as nice as Brother Luke's. <laughs> oh, gosh, hmm. I don't consider it real nice. It's pretty small, and there's not much to it. But uh, it's it's worked for me for. What? Since, let me see, uh, 2008. 2008 is when I uh, joined YouTube. So you know what's funny is if you guys if you guys watch Luke's old videos, you'll swear he's in the same room, except that there's some windows missing in in the back. But the layout's exactly the same. But uh, come to find out, it's a completely different room, a different house, even right, Luke? Yes. Yeah. It's interesting thing is uh, we've. We bought this house about, uh, my wife and I argue about this. I have to check it out see who's right. But I think it's closer to 10 years ago. 
my wife says eight years ago but so we've we've lived here for a while but before this house we lived in a on almost identical house but it was like 25 miles away it was opposite ends of the valley so but so when you look at my my office and my videos from back in those days it looks like i'm in the same office except for the uh the bend so no, he notices the details so he can tell that there were some windows that i don't have uh in this house hmm. but the, the floor plans really the same as the other one so that's how it worked out um all right did uh did i see this lisa's here lisa's here okay great Lisa, we've all said hello to everybody. So uh, we were talking about you behind your back, but you know, when people talk behind your back, you know, it, it's always kind, wonderful things we say. So uh, why don't you say hello to everybody, sister? Praise the Lord, beloved of the Most High God, in the mighty name of King Jesus. Thank you very much for having me again, Brother Luke. Hello to everyone on the panel and hello to everyone in the chat. Did I miss a question? No, no, we haven't gotten to the question portion yet. We're just still okay. in a little, uh, you know, uh, chat and intros and hellos. Okay, well, just so you know, I'm just doing it through my phone because my internet is still tripping today. <laughs> so uh, I was would hope that you would extend me the courtesy of answering for me with when it comes to the results for the true and false. All right. Um, Ben, do you want to log in her answers, or do you want me to do it? Uh, if you would do that, look, that'd be great. Okay, I'll go ahead and so once you let me know what your answer is, I'll make sure I post it for you. Okay. Thank you, brother Luke. Much appreciated. All right, and uh, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one that's noticed. It sounded like you're dragging a little bit. Uh, you seem a little tired, and uh, I know you haven't been feeling 100 percent lately. So everybody, just keep on praying for Sister Lisa's. Uh, health how, how are thank you, you thank you much appreciated oh i have my good days and my bad and today was a little bit rough but i'm here <laughs> i'm glad you're here yeah, yeah. And we're all very grateful that you can be with us every time you're with us it's always better it's always yep. better with you, you than without you no doubt about that thank you so very much mm -hmm. um all right so um looks like we've got the chat room uh heather uh, she sent us a message earlier, an hour before we were going to start saying, hey, it's not up yet. What's going on? So maybe Heather had her wires crossed about the time zones or something. But we usually start at 630 Pacific, which is 930 Eastern time. So uh, there you go, Heather. Well, I'm truth, sure. be told, truth be told, uh, I like Crips. I was also napping and woke up a little later than I wanted to. So I usually like to put the program up or the uh you know, uh, put it in the street in people's feeds uh, anywhere from three, two to three hours before. And I was late on that. So I apologize here at Heather. I didn't mean to cause you any. Uh... Hey, uh, you know, I, I know. <laughs> 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 what? what was that? Kills. <laughs> the accused in oh. French. There is such a thing as viruses transmitted transmitted through the computers, you know, computer viruses. But I'm wondering if they like uh, things are communicable through the computer. Like uh, I, I take naps all the time throughout the day. I'm in and out of sleep all the time, and I've told told everybody about it. I'm wondering if you actually caught that from me, uh, Crips and, and Ben. <laughs> now I think it's, this time of year, I think it's something in the air. I I don't know. But I just feel um, I usually have the windows open, and that causes me to get sleepier, I guess, or sleep deeper um, too. So hmm. mm -hmm. you're like a cat. For, yes. Yeah. In the sunshine. Yeah. Well, I uh, just Ben, just keep this in mind in the future. Heather says you, Ben, you had me nervous, uh, but yes. she, sorry about that. Heather. It's all good now. Uh, so. Just keep that in mind, Ben. When you when you do something like that, you can cause some people to stress out. <laughs> <laughs> Don't stress us out. <laughs> All right. Okay. Like I'm not asking enough of Ben already. <laughs> I think you should ask more of him, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Let's see how much let's, let's see how much burden we can put on him and see before he can actually breaks and just totally cracks up. <laughs> 
Sure. That's too much fun for Fellowship Friday. Yeah. No. <laughs> I think, we, I think we, you're right, Jen. We crossed the line there somewhere, I think. Right. <laughs> It's a labor of love. You guys know that. <laughs> well, you know, that, that is the most important thing. If it's not, then really you need to reconsider why you're even participating. Uh, yeah. Because, uh, you know, the, we're, we talk about works uh, and they're not necessary for salvation. Uh, but works is a, is a privilege that we have uh, to be ambassadors for Christ. And if we get busy working in ministry, uh, whether it's fellowship or Bible studies or anything else, um, it's a privilege to do it. But if we if we think of it as a burden, then uh, you need to reevaluate everything because it should be a labor of love. Hmm, I agree. Mm -hmm. All right. So I guess uh, uh, in the chat room, hey, Church for the Truth, how are you doing tonight? Uh, that's Kevin. So let make sure everybody welcomes Kevin back. back. Welcome back, Kevin. Welcome back, Evan. <laughs> Welcome yeah. back. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's uh, let's move on. If there's nothing we need to talk about first, let's move to the first question, Ben. Okay. This uh, is kind of a softball, uh, but it's just an icebreaker. Um, and it is, it is impossible, or I should say true or false, it is impossible to know without, without a doubt that you are saved. Hmm. Wow. Do you want to tell us who uh, submitted that? Is it that is Heather's? That is Heather's. Sure. Okay, it's impossible to know without a doubt that you are saved. Okay, so that's Heather. Uh, so there's no need for anybody else to, for us to go last. So who wants to jump on that one first? Uh, I'll, I'll I'll go. Uh, okay, go ahead, brother. I'll be your Huckleberry, as they say. <laughs> yeah. Is it impossible <laughs> to know without a doubt that you are saved? Uh, no. Uh, it is, oh, no, so it's, it is impossible. Okay, the question reads, it is impossible to know without a doubt that you are saved. Uh, I would have to answer certainly false. I believe that God gives us many conditions uh, in his word, and also his word says that his very own Holy Spirit communes with our spirit and lets us know that we're his. Uh, uh, it is. It is very, very possible. I would say the opposite is true. It is very, very possible to know without a doubt that you're saved. Uh, now, having said that, I know I have heard and talked to many people that uh, talk about having doubts. Um, I've had doubts in the past, uh, temporarily. Temporarily, uh, a thought or a, a fear that jumps up, am I really saved or I uh, commit some sin? Uh, when my understanding was uh, not where it is now, where God has brought it to now, to understand it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with what I do. It doesn't mean that I have a license to live any way I want or sin or anything like that. But uh, in the past, and, and I think of those as uh, fiery darts. Those are attacks uh, uh, from Satan uh, that wants to bring uh, doubt in, in many cases. Uh, but yeah, certainly false, I would say. You can know that you are saved. Um, uh, anybody, anybody can know that they're saved. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'll go ahead and go next. Um, I also answered certainly false. Um, uh, I know absolutely I'm saved. Uh, I have known that from the night I got saved and that's what to me getting saved is knowing that you are saved. And, uh, you know, we, this subject has been discussed a lot in this congregation uh, over the last few years. And um, my position is simply that um, when you believe the gospel, uh, it means that uh, you do uh, believe that you have certainty. You have absolute assurance. If you do not have certainty, that's, that's why I, uh, I asked that this diagnostic questions I learned from uh, D. James Kennedy course, uh, Evangelism Explosion. I took that course in, uh, uh, let's say, around March of 1987, or shortly after I got saved. I joined a local church and took a course on evangelism, and and uh, they start off by saying, you need to diagnose if someone's saved or not before you know what to say to them. And the way you diagnose it is you ask them, are you certain you have eternal life and you're going to heaven? And if you are certain, why? Based on what? So, uh, and I, I believe that um, believing the gospel means 
that you believe that you are saved and it's settled and it's guaranteed and it's irreversible. I believe eternal security is the gospel. Uh, it's not really good news if we don't know that we've, or we're guaranteed and we, we eternal life and you know it's not certain. But what happens after we get this gift of eternal life? Well, um, I, I disagree with some that say that the person will never doubt or could never be led into apostasy. So uh, I believe that this certainty and assurance is necessary to get salvation because you're not really believing if you have doubts mixed in with it. You can't have any doubts and, and, and believe because those two words contradict each other. They, uh, it's just like grace and, and, and works. They nullify each other. So uh, you've got to have absolute certainty uh, and this assurance uh, that in order to get saved. If you don't reach that point of, of confidence, then uh, I would question whether you even understand and believe what the gospel is. However, once you are saved, uh, I do think it's clear in the Bible that there's many cases. I think the book of Galatians, is a, that's what it's all about. Uh, people who really got saved, they're called sons, they're brethren, a child of God, and so on, feel, uh, in this, having the Spirit of God in their hearts. So these people are really saved people, and yet they're being chastised for going into apostasy. They got led astray by false teachers who, who told them that they got to also practice Judaism. So that happens today, too, where someone gets saved, and they don't have a lot of knowledge about the Bible yet, and they get a some person who is more advanced in Bible study than they are, and they, they lead them into lordship heresies. Okay. Uh, so I think that does happen. People go into apostasy, and I do think that people do sometimes have a crisis of faith, either just very temporarily, or it could be a long thing that uh, they, they, they have their doubt, and they can even reject God. And But um, that's why I say there is such a thing as an un, uh, a saved non-believer, a person who believed and got saved, and now they no longer believe. And uh, the, I believe this verse um, is talking about salvation. If you read the context, it says, um, uh, if, if we have no faith, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. So I think that um, if I were to lose faith, that uh, Jesus is going to remain faithful and keep his promise to me regardless. Uh, all right, who wants to go next? I'll go. Go ahead. Um, I'm going to say certainly false. I know that I know that I know that I'm saved without a doubt. But I will say when I was a baby Christian, right after I got saved in 2000, um, I had some fleeting doubts. Um, and that was partly due because the church that I started going to after I was saved, like right after, they talked a lot about or believed in, in works. And there was some of that mixed in of like... And it, it, nobody ever came out and said, you know, you have to do works to keep your salvation. But it was almost implied. And, and yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's really weird. So it kind of put me in this place where I was questioning a little bit. But I've it's I've grown out of that. That wore off a long time ago. And so um, there is I have certainty for that. Praise God. So certainly boss. Awesome. All right, thank you. I'm a little slow with my uh, unmute there, sister. Thank you. Uh, all right, sister Lisa, what's your answer? Uh, I was listening to everybody's answers and I forgot the question. So, <laughs> brother <laughs> Luke, sister Lisa. Sister Lisa. <laughs> well, I have a general idea. It was about whether or not uh, it was certainly true that you could be assured, but I don't remember exactly how it was phrased. Hey, ben, could you read the question again for her? Yes, yes, it's true. It's true or false. True or false. It is impossible to know. Um, let me see exact wording myself. Um, mm -hmm. It is impossible to know without a doubt that you are saved. Okay, certainly false. It is impossible to know without a doubt. Yes, certainly false. Uh, this, see, this for me is just is always fun because <laughs> I I got saved as a child. So for me, I came into this with the simplicity of a child, which is exactly what Christ said one had to do, and. And so for me, even though the devil came to challenge and cause questions as life 
you know, progress. He gonna make <laughs> one one thing's for sure. The devil gonna find out whether or not you really believe, because mm -hmm. he certainly come to try your faith. <laughs> mm, good and point. Uh, <laughs> so I remember, I, I I've told this in a, one of my videos many moons ago. I don't remember which one right now, but I had an uncle who was a Mormon for many many years, and my father and my uncle. Uh, well, he had, he actually was my father's uncle, so that would have made him my great uncle. But they used to get my my father, his brother, and their uncle used to get into these big discussions at Christmas and Thanksgiving when he would come visit uh, because of his Mormon doctrine. And so I remember I would. I would listen sometimes and other times I would just, I'm a child, so I'd go play or whatever. But this one particular, I don't remember if it was Christmas or Thanksgiving, my grandmother had made this enormous spread like she always did. And uh, it was awesome. And I had prepared my plate and I'm sitting there enjoying my plate of food. I'm about to just like tear it up. Mm. And my uncle, my great uncle came in, sat down. His name was Peter. He came in, he sat down, and he said, you know, he's asking me different questions about the Lord. And I'm eating my food, and he's really annoying me because I, I heard them explain the gospel to him clearly like a dozen times, and he's rejected it. So I'm thinking, he ain't going to listen to me, so I don't even know why he's asking me any questions. <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't say it. I was just thinking, and I'm a child, right? I'm like 12. So... He says, well, how do you know that you're saying so? Because Jesus said it. You know, he's God. He can't lie. And either you believe him or you don't. So I was really annoyed. So I might have even been a little, a little sharp with him about it. And he said, well, you're sure? I said, I'm 100% sure. He's God. He said it. You know? <laughs> so it was to that nature that I'm speaking to him. And... I was just like, I just want to eat my food in peace, <laughs> Uncle. So after he asked me a few questions, he got up and he walked away. Now, many years later, I'd say, again, I was 12, about I was about 30, 35-ish, somewhere in there. Uh, no, actually, I'm about 28, right in there. And I get a, uh, my father gets a phone call, and he's rejoicing because my uncle, which is his brother, found out that my uncle Peter came to faith in Christ and they were both rejoicing. And my dad got off the phone and told us, I said, that's great. Praise God. So years later, after I bought my first home and moved in and everything, my uncle Peter calls me and we get to talking and he's getting up in, 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 in years and he's having some health problems and things. And he was coming really what would be his last visit to California. And he was calling me to say hello and saying he could hope he could see me when he got out here. And I did get to visit with him. Thank the Lord. But I asked him when I'm on the phone, we're just about to hang up. And I said, oh, uncle, I never asked you what led you to faith in Christ. Because I remember when you used to have those long heated debates with, with my dad and, and his brother. Uh, what caused you to come to faith in Christ? He said, you don't know. I said, no. He said, you. And I'm me? He said, yes. He said, the day that you were in the kitchen sitting there eating that food and I asked you questions about the Lord. You answered me and you were so confident and I couldn't understand that. You were a child. He said, and you had absolute confidence that you were saved. He said, and I didn't have it and I wanted it. Wow. Mm. And I tell you that, man, that blew me away. That, that humbled me so. And I said, see, this, this is... The gospel message is how simplistic mm -hmm. it actually is. And it is so sad and it is so tragic that people complicate and muddy up the gospel of grace that is through simple faith in Christ, his shed blood, his work on Calvary, and our faith and trust in that, that will be the absolute, total, and complete payment for our sin now and forevermore the moment we believe. I just don't understand that. I don't understand, except that these people either have a absolute religious demonic spirit 
They re- I've come to believe there are people that really, they think they're saved and they're the absolute most religious, wicked thing ever. And I'm not talking about anything other than their absolute denial of who the Lord Jesus Christ actually is and what he has actually done. And they shut up the kingdom from people with their false gospel message. So, you know, that's why I kind of have to chuckle because as I've said before, when I was a child, I can't even recall a moment I didn't believe. My parents always taught me about God. They taught me Jesus was God back when they were Roman Catholics. So from day one, I always believed Jesus was God. He died for my sin. He paid for my sin because these were the things that they told me. But then when I heard the gospel clearly and fully understood it, that I was a sinner and then he had done this for me, I, my attitude was like, well, I always believed that. So then I just prayed. And I said, okay, Lord, this is all what it takes. I always believe, but I'll pray. So that's what I'm saying. I have talked to people who would tell you the same thing from the time they were a child. They knew that the gospel message was true the moment they heard it. And they always believed. They always believed in God. They always believed Jesus was God. They always believed that, that the Bible was his word. So, you know, but then there are people that want to come along and challenge that and complicate that and try to talk people out of their salvation when they have always trusted in him. And I'm telling you the God's honest truth. The Lord knows I lie not. I have never one day ever considered anything else to be the truth, not Buddhism, Shintoism, Islam. It doesn't matter what it is. Because I was filled, just like Jesus said, when you receive the true gospel, you will not hunger and thirst for anything or anyone else. And that's the truth. That's my answer. Awesome. 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 Wonderful story about you and your uncle. That was fantastic. Oh, I see Sister Angel's here with her new photograph. Well, sister, we were in great anticipation of your new picture here that Ben told us about it. Yeah, we cured her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we Wait, have her, her, check her ID. Oh, gosh. See? No. See what, how easily I offend someone? Oh, there she's back. Again. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that the picture she was using before? No. No, no it isn't. But it, it looks like the same person, but it's a different picture. Oh, you, I offended her this time. She left. <laughs> no, right. Maybe it was me. Left again. <laughs> Crips, Crips, uh, you're. I'm rubbing off on you, aren't I? Yeah, a little bit. A yeah, little bit. I have to be I mean, careful. Both of us are highly offensive now. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, when she gets back, we'll we'll uh, welcome her. Um, let me see who hasn't answered yet. Uh, um, ben. Ben. Ben is your your uh, Crips. You answered right. Yes, I did. Yep. You went. Okay, Ben. Go ahead. Uh. Yeah, um, absolutely. We, we can know uh, for sure uh, based on based on the objective of God's word. Um, you know, there's plenty of passages that clear, clearly say uh, he who believes has everlasting life. Um, and um, what's the saying? Uh, to be or not to be, you know, if you if you believe that you, you're a son of God, then you are a son of God. It's 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 a. Uh, it's kind of uh, you know it's it's an objective truth, and I, I always rely on that objective truth of God's word. I know some people will um, refer to, uh, and there's plenty of uh, countless verses. I think we all agree that, that that make that unequivocal that if you believe, uh, you have eternal life. Um, but some people I hear often will um, appeal to uh, something some more subjective, like an inner wit- witness. Um, and I, that's one thing I've, I've been studying recently. Um, like, for example, people say like Romans um, 8, uh, 8 and um, what's it? Uh, me, yeah, okay. So Romans 8, 15 says, or 14 through 16 says, For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage to fear, again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption by whom we, we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And I think a lot of people read that as the spirit himself bears witness to our spirit that we're the uh, children of God. And I, uh, if you actually say that word with there or bears witness, 
it uh, it's a it's only used it's used very infrequently in the Bible. And it always means to testify jointly or or corrob corroborate the witness. So uh, I believe what that verse is saying is that our spirit, because we believe we're the sons of God, plus we have the Holy Spirit. Those two spirits are joined together, essentially separate but joined, uh, just like we you know we died to the law, so that we were married to the law, essentially to the flesh. But when we believe, we're married to the spirit, and um, and so you know we're married to it. And uh, just as we were baptized into Christ, we certainly will be um, we're baptized in His death. We'll be certainly baptized in His resurrection of the spirit. Um, but our our spirit and, and the Holy Spirit within us bears witness to God the Father, God that yes, we're ch the child of God. Bible, you know, this, we all know that in the Bible it makes many references to. Um, uh, two or by the by the testimony of two two or three witnesses. So again, I believe that satisfies the requirement to Abba Father that our spirit, because we believe that, that we're children of God of God, plus the Holy Spirit within us also testifies of this fact, and uh, that's how you know that's how Abba Father uh, knows that we are His essentially. And again, that that word bear witness is uh, bear, it always remains testified jointly, and then any uh, lawyer will tell you that uh, or judge that. Um, you know, uh, well, well, even the Bible, like I said, you, you you always have to have two or three witnesses. So, if my if my witness, if I if I if I, uh, if for example, if if I, my spirit testified to the Holy Spirit within me that I'm the child of God, and the Holy Spirit within me testified to my spirit that I'm the child of God, well, that would be uh, that would mean that we would need each other. That would only be one witness, and any witness. I think judge would tell you that if uh, two witnesses are, are their if their testimony is dependent on each other, then that that witness is not one hundred percent reliable because they're they're not independent witness because they both have both their testimonies or their accounts rely on each other. So it, it, uh, again, that's one problem as well. And then there's other verses in First John that talk about the, the witness within us. But I believe if you read that in context, it's about, it's about abiding in Christ. And it, it, if you abide in the Son, you abide in the Father. And then the Holy Spirit also again testifies of these things. So that's a that's a common theme in John. Um, and then also when J Jesus was uh, doing his uh, performing his ministry, he said, "Don't believe me, but believe the works that I do, or and believe the words that I say." The words were given by the Father. That's one witness. And then the Holy Spirit was bearing witness to him as well through the works. So you again all through the Bible you have to have two or three witnesses. Um, and uh, you know a lot of people say they, they appeal to that inner witness. Uh, I believe all the Bible is saying there is that if you if you believe the if you believe the truth, that you've internalized it, so the truth is in you in that sense, uh, and the Holy Spirit's obviously within you. I'm not sure if I'm making any sense, but I guess what I'm saying is um, I think it's important to rely on the objective word of God, the objective truth of God's word, and not uh, some internal they call it, you know liver quiver <laughs> that you know you feel something that that uh, tells you that you're the son of God. I, I think. Uh, if you want assurance, it's always too important to look at the obje objective truth of, of Scripture as opposed to any feelings that we have um, internally. So that's my answer. Right. But yes, we can absolutely know. Okay, so your answer is certainly false. Yes, I am. Okay, you posted your answer? Yes, I did. How do those answers look now anyway? Do you have a running uh, tool? Yes, it's, uh, I think it's 100% certainly false. Yeah, 11 said okay. certainly false. So that's all we have. All right, well, let's get Sister Angel in here. Sister, will you say hello to everybody? And then have you been listening? Do you know how to answer the question we're on? Um, I, I have been listening, but I'm trying to figure out which question it is from the list, and I can't figure it out because I came in I came in just uh, just in the middle of the, the actual question, so I'm not sure which one you're on. Okay. Um, so but, uh, hi, everybody. Yeah, hi. That's, that's the first thing. Let's get a greeting from you. All right. Yes. Yeah, sorry about this. Uh, uh, Joel is getting called in like every other week now. So he had the uh, apartment flooded. And so we're uh, I, I waited on him as long as I could because uh, I, you know, I may have to leave a bit early depending on if he doesn't get home in time to get the kids, you know, uh, finally wrangled or they might fall asleep. Uh, and then I'll be I'll be good to go. But um, it's uh, it's good to be with you guys. I thought Lisa wasn't going to be able to make it too, so I really wanted to to be here. But I think her voice was the first one I heard when I joined. So, um, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, so I guess Lisa did end up uh, uh, coming. She did. She's here. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, All right. Uh, I'm here, sister. Tell her the hey, question. Lisa. 
Tell yes. uh, the question yeah. so that she's able to know which question we're dealing with. Yeah, I, I did a little out of order. Sorry about that, guys. But um, I, I thought we start with kind of a softball one. <laughs> um, but the first question is true or false. It is impossible to know without a doubt that you are saved. Uh, uh, false? <laughs> I mean, it's impossible to know without a doubt that yes. you're saved. Uh, Good answer. False? Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, that's the thing that I, that I don't, you know, one of the reasons why for the longest time, you know, when I first, you know, became, you know, a viewer even just of, of the, you know, church of the eternally secure and talking doctrine and everything, I tended to kind of go along with not so much. Okay, I never thought that, that you know, if you doubted you were lost. It's not that I ever went there. But, you know, I kind of tolerated the idea or I kind of understood it a little bit at least. I didn't think it was scriptural, but I kind of, I, you know, sometimes you'll have something that maybe you can't back up with scripture, but it's sort of like a gut feeling or something like kind of just sort of uh, feels right to you or your biases. So you kind of like toy with it or whatever. Um, and uh, I, I thought, well, you know, I could see that because I couldn't understand how people could doubt their salvation because I, for me, I know that myself, it, like it has nothing to do with me whatsoever from the, the, from the moment that I believed. Like it, I never like looked at myself when it came to my salvation. Um, not even in the slightest bit. Uh, I knew that it was all about what Jesus did <laughs> and that, um, you know, basically like I took myself out of the equation. Like I recognized that it, you know, it wasn't, um, there was, there was no way to, to like that makes uh, sense. measure that my makes salvation. Sense. Yeah. Does that make, again, like, it like really it's does. not personal. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's how it feels like it's personal. The relationship's personal. What Christ did for us, you know, it was personal on, you know, on an individual level for every single person, uh, you know, that, you know, that ever was and ever will be. But uh, when it comes to like, you know, it's not a merit based situation. It's like uh, the way and the best way I can put it is it, it you know, that I always say that salvation is like the bare minimum passing grade. Right. So you don't fail the class. You don't, um, you, you know, you act, it, but you know, obviously you're not actually striving for it or working for it. So, you know, that's where the analogy falls apart. But the difference is that, you know, so self salvation is the bare minimum passing grade. And no, normally nobody really feels that all that accomplished by, you know, forgetting that. Right. But, uh, and then service is, you know, that's, uh, that's like the extra credit. That's like the, the thing that, you know, that, that, is, you know, you kind of set yourself apart with it. it um, you know, if you choose to do it right. Um, now, obviously we don't, uh, we work to pass a class. We don't work for salvation. So don't uh, take it that way. But I, I, I struggle to find a better way to put it to where people understand that um, the difference between the two things. And, um, but for me, uh, I didn't understand how people could doubt uh, their salvation at all it, it, while understanding the gospel in the first place because it, it was so completely unrelated to to anything that they do. <laughs> it was all about do you do you, do you, do you acknowledge what what Christ did? That's it. You know that's that's the that's the part that you play in the, in the you know in it whatsoever. It's just you acknowledge the truth that go, you know that that's 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 really all there is to it. Um, but. Um, you know, I, I absolutely understand now that, see, God, he can expect so little from us that he can't even expect us to consistently, uh, uh, you know, uh, like, you know, once we're saved, that, you know, he can't even count on us to at least uh, 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 always, uh, always uh, maintain perfect faith in, in, you know, in your, you know, in their, your, your salvation or in, in, you know, in the gospel. He can't even expect us to, um, to meet that bare minimum requirement <laughs> because it, it's really is like, uh, you know, he had to set the bar so low in order to save any of us that, um, he, you know, he, no, he can't expect us to, 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 to always maintain this perfect faith and like, uh, peace and, um, assurance that, you know, that, you know, where, where doubt never enters our mind or even, um, outright apostasy. I, you know, I do agree with that now that, that, you know, I, I still can't imagine that happening to me, uh, or anybody that I know, but I, 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 I recognize there's so many different, uh, pe people, like the types of people, mentalities that can come across the gospel and believe it and get saved. And a lot of those people are never even going to be curious enough to, to listen to a Bible study. You know what I mean? Like, like they're not even going to sit around and investigate like, like some people that that's just not their mentality. So those people will also be, 
uh, perhaps sub, you know subject to um, uh, doubt and flights of uh, fancy, or or you know, or, or being deceived. Uh, in one way or another, or or getting angry with God because they're immature and something really bad happens to them, and so they spitefully decide to say that they don't believe. But really, from till the day they die, even if they say you know they don't believe, somewhere deep down they're really just trying to stick it to God. Because even because even um, I experienced that prior to getting saved. I experienced once I lost a lot of people in one year. I I, I experienced uh, subconsciously when I was. You know, I, I claimed to be an atheist, but I was really um, at that point, I recognized that there was a God and I was I was angry with him and I was trying to punish him by by saying I didn't believe in him, you know. And um, so I don't think uh, I, I do think it's absolutely possible to know without a doubt that you're saved. Um, uh, I think that that's what is intended for, you know, and that is at the at least at the, at the point of believing that is, you know, that's the requirement. But um, to, for, for that to go on and, you know, indefinitely without fail for every single believer throughout every single day of their life until they until they go home with the Lord. No, I mean, you know, we can't expect that of people. But um, I think that for me, the you know, the the biggest uh, thing that like to, like I, I never I've never worried about that. I've never once turned the microscope on myself when it comes to my salvation. Now, when it comes to my walk or my 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 progress, my growth, totally different story. My own hypocrisy, my own um, you know uh, blindness to my own faults. That's that's a totally different thing, and that would maybe affect like how I feel my relationship with God is right. But um, the, I, I I've never once uh uh. uh felt the need to look at myself in order to determine whether I'm safe. But if, you know, uh, if people are impressionable or weak in, or weak in faith, weak in on um, their scriptural understanding, they, maybe they don't have fellowship with a lot of believers. You know, my neighbor across the street, she's a, a lifelong like believer, believes the true gospel through and through eternal security. She's such a blessing to have right across the street. You know, she's in her sixties. Um, and even she was, t- and we're in a small little town. And uh, uh, out in the country, and she was telling me two days ago. She said, "You know, she wanted me to come over more to talk with her about Jesus." Now she goes to our church, you know, and she's very active. And she can't find people in her own church which has the correct gospel, uh, and it, you know, preaches eternal security that uh, actually want to just sit around and talk about the Bible and Jesus, because, like like this, it's enjoyable. You know what I mean? And yeah. if you consider that, like you consider like how vulnerable are people like that? to error if they're not even curious enough i mean because i you know you see what i'm saying like but that doesn't affect that doesn't make me doubt their salvation um but i could see how it would make them uh vulnerable to error to where they might uh fall into some serious error because they're not even uh intellectually curious enough to 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 to, uh become self-assured in their own understanding of scripture if that makes sense. Um, and uh, I think that that's a, a really important uh, part of being very confident and bold um, when it comes to your ministry and also you know, your, your understanding um, is that you uh, are self-motivated, uh, you know, and I, you know, I believe also motivated by the Holy Spirit, although I, you know, I, I fully believe that you know, people can be indwelled with the Holy Spirit and, you know, you wouldn't see hide nor hair of it, you know, <laughs> uh, in a lot of cases, um, you know, and it may not manifest the same with everybody because God may not intend for everybody to be used the same way. Um, and, uh, you know, some people, maybe it would puff them up if they were, uh, in, you know, curious and knowledgeable about scripture. Maybe God has a different purpose. He's going to use them in, in a way where uh, that would not be beneficial somehow. I mean, you just never know. So that's, I don't think that that's a good way to, I don't think you should judge people's salvation on that. But when people are not motivated to, to be bold and outspoken and, and um, self-assured in their um, understanding, you know, I do believe that it opens the door for, you know, for them to fall into error, including doubt. Um, and I think that's probably most often that's how it happens. And also pride um, can lead them down, down uh, the road of error to where they end up, uh, uh, you know, perhaps, you know, being ch- chastised. Um, and at that point, you know, who knows, they could, um, they could take it the wrong way and, uh, uh, you know, start questioning themselves a lot, but, um, but no, I, I, it's definitely, 
I, I would hope that the the, the, the the gold standard and also, you know, I would even hope the, the most common uh, situation would be that, you know, a believer generally would never, uh, uh, would have no problem knowing 100% for sure at all times that they're saved. Because that is what, that's what, that's what God wanted for us. And we're, we're supposed to know that it has nothing to do with us. So all we have to do is look at Jesus to know that. We have to analyze his character and his integrity and in God's character and God's integrity and, and the faithfulness of his word, um, uh, you know, in order to to feel assured uh, in our in our standing with him and in our eternal life with him. Wait. Sorry, I've got the sniffles pretty bad. It's gotten chilly here all overnight and I'm outside. Uh, I, I, I'm getting to mute probably every time I'm not talking because I'm sniffing too much. Oh. So I hear uh, crickets. Uh, uh, is that some sound effect someone's using, or are those real crickets? Where those you... are real crickets, oh. real Indiana crickets. I think. Okay. Well, we have gonna, really creepy gonna, crickets here. They're I called crickets. I was someone if, if someone was putting crickets there. I, I know. I wonder if they're, they're, they're the cave crickets, because people always comment about the, how loud the crickets are here. And we yeah. have these creepy crickets I've never seen anywhere else, but they're like they're awful. They look like spiders. Are you in the yeah. country? Yes, yes, I'm out in the country in Indiana. So uh, <laughs> the nearest town to me has 1,500 people. So, all right, you finished with your answer? Yes. Okay. All right, I guess everybody's had an answer, and I'll give everybody a, a second chance to say more if you want. But uh, I want to respond to a couple of things I heard. Uh, um, Sister Lisa, you, you said that uh, this, this gospel and its salvation is simple. And I'll shout amen. That's absolutely true. It's simple. In fact, um, I've been saying that uh, salvation is simple and easy. I've been saying it for decades. And I'm not the only one. I'm, I, I, I might have had an original idea the last 34 years in theology, but Unlikely, every time I think I have an original idea, I discover later that, you know, that idea has been around for a long time. But the, the idea that uh, this gospel and our, and our faith is uh, it's simple and easy is not just my opinion. Uh, it's, it's, it's established that that's really what it is. It's the simplicity of the cross uh, and um, easy because uh, the only thing that's required is just to, to, to believe. Believe what the Bible and Jesus said about salvation, and uh, uh, so there's nothing that we're required to do except believe, and it's not complicated. It's simple. And yes, uh, Sister Lisa, there are those that are making it too complicated, way too complicated, and uh, I, I just don't think a person has to uh, uh, become a theologian uh, before they can become a Christian. Um, uh, the, there's very little we have to understand uh, from the Bible. I, I've said this so many times that you could be wrong about 99% of the things in the Bible, but you just got to get two things right. Who is Jesus and how do I get saved? And so uh, uh, if you had to get everything in the Bible right or much more right, then uh, it would become a work system of uh, study and become a qualified theologian to get saved. Uh, so it is so simple that even a child can understand it, uh, that, look, Jesus paid for all my sins on the cross. He promised me eternal life, so I have it. It's settled. It's guaranteed. And uh, and the, the person doesn't have to know and believe uh, much more than that, I don't think. And, and even though we, I'd like to explain to them everything I know about Jesus, everything I know about his ministry and all the deeper things that uh, we learn through Bible studies, but a person doesn't have to understand all those things uh, it, it, to get saved. And if we try to impose all the this deeper knowledge and more uh, broad knowledge of theology on someone, then we're putting them some some kind of a work system of study. Uh, and it's easy. So it's simple and it's easy. Um, all it's required is believing it. Now, Sister Lisa, I heard you say that you believed since you were a child and that uh, and then one day you, uh, you you realized that what you had believed all along is, is what you were needed to believe. And you right. said a prayer. You said a prayer. 
Yeah. Now, some people would object to the to the fact that you, if you said a prayer at the time, this is like the the sinner's prayer or saying a prayer to get salvation. There are people who object to that. Um, mm -hmm. But I, and the same thing with altar calls and all these other things that are we routinely routinely see. Mm -hmm. But I, I would say that um, I wouldn't care uh, if you said a prayer or walked the sawdust trail, as Billy Sunday called it, <laughs> uh, or, or, or uh, confessed with your mouth, or uh, all these things in the Bible that some people object to. Uh, I wouldn't care if you did all those things, as long as you you told me that you, what you believed was correct. All the other things don't really matter. Right. Um, um, if you believe, that's enough. Uh, so I think that, um, so unfortunately, uh, it, it is being complicated. It is simple and it is easy. And Ben, you, you talked about the witnessing and all that, but to me, the the, the, the witness that is, all that we need is this account of the resurrection. Because that's what Jesus promised he would provide as proof. And that's the event that changed everything. Because until the resurrection, it was over. The, the, the apostles were hiding out for their lives. They had no uh, faith at all. Uh, and, and then at the resurrection, they preached unto their all, all their deaths. Uh, so uh, that resurrection is what Jesus gave us to as proof. That's why it says that by the resurrection, we're justified. Or that means that our faith is justified. You're justified and believe in Jesus because he proved himself by the resurrection. So it's that resurrection that, that should give us the, this kind of confidence that uh, that we're talking about, this assurance and certainty. Uh, and uh, all right, so I think I covered some of the responses to the, uh, of what was said. Uh, who wants to say more about this this question? Uh, I'll I say do. It. I do. Okay. No, brother Chris, wait your turn. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Uh, my, no. my mom didn't Crazy. raise an impolite uh, gentleman. Not sure. <laughs> I don't want you stealing my thunder. You have such great ideas. Oh, thank you. Uh, flattering, flattering. <laughs> well, Brother Luke got a little preaching him right there. Um, that was awesome, Brother Luke. And yeah. as, as for the rest of the people who are that I borrowed from CES Friday for late night with Lisa and friends, you, you see why. Brother Ben, just an angel. I mean, they brought it. And this is what I love. Brother Cripps as well. Brother Cripps. Oh, I, wow. I, yeah. Well, I mean, you always bring it, brother, but it's just that I really grabbed you for that voice of yours. But anyway, uh, sure. I understand. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> Praise God. But no, just having a little fun. But everybody has brought to the table their different aspects, like Sister Angel was saying. It's like, why would I ever question that? And that's the way I felt when I was a child. When I was explaining that to my great uncle, I was like, I don't understand why you don't believe. The Bible says it. Jesus said it. <laughs> you know, it's like. Because I was coming with the simplicity of a child that I didn't need, uh, you know, all this elaborate explanation or any other thing going on. It was simply because Jesus is God. That's what the Bible said. He can't lie. He has declared a thing. And I believe it. <laughs> so and, and this is this is literally the simplicity when people boil it down to that and it's like sister angel was saying those people don't in, in that particular church they don't want to sit around a fellowship and talk about the things of god because they're actually i think they're actually afraid that they they're gonna find something in there to to scare them worse than whatever doctrine that church is already waffling on and teaching them you know i've seen that about people who don't have the assurance of their salvation because they have heard false gospel messages from all these different big heretics. They are scared to get in the Bible. They're scared that they're going to find in there. It's really true. You can lose your salvation. And they've been terrified by those few scriptures that they take out of context and twist to mean that. And so they're actually scared to draw near to God. And they're scared to get into the word. They're scared of everything. Ben, this is what the devil intended when he, he brought those emissaries of the devil for them to hear those false messages, to trouble them in their spirit so they would have no assurance. Because as I keep saying, the whole point, because the devil, once you've been saved, he go, he throws his hands up. He's like, oh, no, not another one. Because if they get a hold to the truth, the Bible says the righteous are as bold as a lion. And he going to have somebody else kicking his butt and taking ground for the kingdom. 
And he doesn't want that. So he has to come and try to steal the word, the word of truth, the word of assurance, because then that person is not on a firm foundation and you cannot do battle when you don't have a firm footing. If you study the way, if you look at boxers, when they fight, if you look at uh, 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 people who do, uh, you know, engage in, with swords, fencing, the, the foot placement is critical. And so if they don't have a firm foundation in Christ, then it causes people to be not sure. So they're not sure where to step. So they don't know what to do. They don't know how to act. And it keeps them in bondage. And this is exactly what the devil tries to do. He has to come bind the strong man that's been created by the Lord Jesus Christ with these false doctrines and these emissaries of the devil that put this mess out there to literally shipwreck a believer's faith. And I think everybody this evening touched on that and explained that very, very well. And I just wanted to commend you all. It was beautiful and I was inspired. Thank you so much. Awesome. Okay, thanks. Uh, Brother Cripps, you wanted to say more. I did. I just, uh, um, I agree with, with Ben. It's kind of a softball question for at, at least those of us on the panel that, I mean, it's called Church of the Eternal Secure, so I hope that everyone is eternally secure. Uh, I, I I wouldn't guess that anyone on the panel would doubt uh, their own salvation. So, um, But generally speaking, it isn't a softball question. The reason I say that is because there are people um, I've argued with that say there's no way uh, they argue the opposite of this. They, they, they would have said certainly true in answer to the question. They would say empirically, we don't have any uh, any proof for sure. We don't have any proof for sure. It's the same thing. I'm, I'm not trying to change the conversation flat earth. This is the best way to do it. Uh, for people that are against flat earth say, y you have, have you seen it? Have, have you seen it from, from quote unquote space? Have you seen the shape of the earth? Do you know for sure that it's, that it's flat? You're not going to know that until you're on the way up. Uh, as a believer, on the way up, and and you 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 have that uh, altitude to be able to see it with your own eyes, be able to see it. They feel the same thing about salvation. That well, you you can be pretty sure, but until you actually until this flesh passes away, until your spirit leaves your body, then you'll know for sure. Then you can say uh, definitively, "Yep, oh well, I guess I'm saved." Um, uh, there are plenty of, everyone knows this, there are plenty of religions out there that uh, they don't have a no-so salvation, they have a hope-so salvation, no doubt about that. And I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, shoring sure, people up, making sure that they know that they know. That they know. Uh, I, I find that uh, a good thing. Uh, I think the problem is is you, you can take that too far. Uh, all we can go by is a personal confession, but uh, softball question for us, but the, the question itself, though, for a lot of people, because they argue and argue and argue against this, um, these are the same people that say you have to persevere to the end. They're putting their salvation on. They have to continue in it uh, until the end. The Calvinists uh, uh, believe that, too. You have to, you, have, you won't really know. I believe, Brother Luke, you'd have to answer this, but the Calvinists, I think, they believe that you have to persevere in the faith, and if you don't persevere, then you were never elect. So, therefore, they believe that you don't really know, you don't know if you're chosen truly until the end. So I wanted to say that. And the last thing I want to say just really quickly, I always appreciate uh, Ben's uh, commentary, but I don't agree uh, with the interpretation of that. The, the scripture that I used when I was uh, answering my question, um, I, uh, I, maybe, I, maybe I don't understand what he's saying fully. Uh, maybe it's something we can discuss later. Uh, but the Holy Spirit doesn't need to, confirm with God. I mean, they're, they're, they're both God. They understand each other. They don't need to, uh, to, to witness to each other about whether we're saved. Uh, I just wanted to say that, but I do agree that we should not rely on our feelings. That's, that's not at all what I rely on. Our feelings can tell us all kinds of things. Uh, so that point, I completely agree, uh, that we have his, his word to study and learn from. And that's the, that's the, uh, the the meat of Christ and his blood and, and uh, learning more of him and seeking him and having a relationship with him. Those things help us uh, know that we're saved as well. Uh, so we do have his word. We can't, can't rely just on how we feel. There are some days maybe I would say that I don't feel saved. 
that that doesn't change the fact that I'm saved. I, my feelings don't change uh, my standing with God or anybody standing with God. So uh, I would definitely agree with that point. That's all. I just wanted to add those two things. Okay. All right. And uh, Jen, did you have more to say? Uh, no, I'm good. I just okay. really appreciate everybody's uh, answers. Lovely. All right. So does uh, anybody else want to say more before we go to the next question? Um, I, I thought of something when um, Lisa was talking about, you know, how Satan tries to derail us. And uh, then that it, if you don't if we don't understand our position in Christ, we can't go to battle. Um, and I, I, I know for a fact that's true from experience. I think we all have uh, uh, experienced that. that. The only way to counter the enemy is to, to, you know, understand and believe that we're dead to sin and alive to God. And there, what's interesting, um, some people might find this interesting in the Old Testament. Uh, when there's passages that saying uh, like you can't go to war unless you could declare your pedigree, and there's other there are other verses where you can't be a priest unless you could de declare your pedigree. In other words, your genealogy. Um, so uh, I see that as a parallel to us. You know, we can't go, we can't fight uh, 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 the spiritual war that we're in successfully unless we understand our position in Christ and our authority in Christ mm -hmm. um, as sons of God. So I think that's uh, so true, Lisa. Mm -hmm. All right. Hey, if there's no more, Good let's point. go to Thank the you. next question, Ben. Okay, the next question is, um, this was from Brother Dave uh, a couple of weeks ago. It is, John 15, 6 teaches that only those who continually abide in Christ and bear fruit will ultimately be saved. And I can read John 15, 6 if you'd like. Yeah, that'd be why don't we why don't we do that if we're gonna use a scripture verse? Maybe it's yeah. good to read. Okay, so let me uh, read that right okay, now. Read it, but I'm, I'm, see, this kind of question, uh, we, it, it might require that like a, a whole chapter be read if you to get the context to really understand it right. But go ahead, I agree. Let's see what's needed. Go ahead. Um, so John fifteen six says, "If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered." And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Okay. So it's it's a common lordship uh, verse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you want me to go first, or does someone else want to go first? Yeah, if you're ready, go ahead, brother. Yeah, sure. So the question reads: John uh, fifteen six teaches that only those who continually abide in Christ. And bear fruit will ultimately be saved. Um, well, that's what it says. But how do we abide in Christ? How, uh, is it put on us? Are, are we like daily choosing to abide in Him, or is abiding in Him part of being saved? Uh, that was my question. Yeah, good question. <laughs> I, I would say that um, this is for people that aren't saved, uh, that will be cast off. I mean, there are there are many other scriptures, many other verses in scripture that talk about those, uh, those things that are going to be burned, you know, cut off and burned, uh, uh, gathered up in bundles and thrown into the fire. That's not believers. So technically it's true. If we don't abide in him, if we don't, if, if uh, we don't have him, the first, let, let's say the first part of the question, it's actually two questions. First part is uh, abiding in Christ. And the second part of the question is bearing fruit. On the second part, the bearing fruit, yeah, I believe that a, a believer will bear fruit, but then we get into the dangerous uh, uh, area of us being fruit inspectors. I think the Holy Spirit, he, he, he's he got it covered with, with believers, whether they're bearing his fruit or not. Um, uh, a believer, if they're not bearing fruit, will be. Uh, I believe they'll be chastised. The Holy Spirit's got it. You don't have to worry about it. Yes. You, uh, we don't have to look at other people and say, oh, that brother or sister's not bearing fruit. It happens all the time, though. They call themselves fruit inspectors. We've, we've touched on this before. I do so many shows. I don't know what show it was that we talked about this, but we have. Um, so it, that's a dangerous place to be in. You can't look at someone, uh, I don't think, you can look at someone's life definitively and say, oh, they're not saved. They're not bearing enough fruit. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe people aren't bearing fruit. doesn't mean they're not saved. I mean, what is necessary to be saved? I think we've all said uh, believing. Uh, so it's not it's not the lifestyle. So it's difficult to know how to answer the question. I guess I I'll say uh, leaning true. I don't know if that's even the, the right because it's uh, I'll have to 
to talk to Brother Dave about his questions. It, it, to me, it's a two-part question, and it's hard to answer both uh, the both parts the same because I don't think it's the same question, but maybe someone else uh, doesn't agree. But there you go. Okay. All right. Who, who would like to go next? I'll take a stab at it. Okay. There you go. <laughs> uh, can I hear the question one more time? John yes, fifteen please. six teaches that only those who continually abide in Christ and bear fruit will ultimately be saved. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Yeah, when I was younger, th those scriptures used to jack me up <laughs> big time, <laughs> stuff like that. Until I realized, after meditating on who our Lord is, and what he's saying, in order to understand the more difficult passages, they have to be weighed in the light of other scripture. So when you look at this, one, when Jesus said, for example, if my words abide in you and you abide in me, those things like that, he is talking about being born again. Mm -hmm. Because you can't, you, he can't abide in somebody who is not a believer. Mm -hmm. And a believer cannot abide in him. He also said in another passage, he said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. So we have to understand that the letter of this word is not the spirit of this word. When something is difficult, the Lord wants you to press in to get at the truth of it. When you're born again, you are born of the spirit. Therefore, and Jesus is the word, the Bible declares in the gospel of John that he is the word. And so the word will abide in you when you are born again. You are born of the spirit. He is the word, the living word. So he, he comes to abide in you. Then his word is abiding in you. This is one of the reasons why when a person is really born again, even if they encounter some error or some deception or what, they get brought right back because Jesus is the anchor. The spirit is uh, the Holy Spirit that dwells on the inside of them, having been born of the spirit bears witness to the truth. And so, you know, it's that still small voice and say, no, that's not right. No, don't, you know, and it will lead you actually away from the false doctrine. It will lead you away from the leaven of the Pharisees. It will lead you to the truth of his word, you know, come back to my word, come back to this truth. And, and so I think a lot of us have had that experience where we might've believed something that wasn't quite right or wasn't right at all. And then the light of his word illuminated us literally to what the truth is. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Well, that yes. path is in Christ. So, you know, it, it, it's not, it's really actually not a difficult passage <laughs> if you're looking at it with spiritual eyes. I think too often people have to, uh, they're trying to understand it with their natural understanding and this is one of the things when Paul says to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. We have to try to remember to look at the word with the spiritual eyes and not only just of our spirit, man, but the Holy Spirit speaking expressly to us and bears witness to the truth of his word. So, you know, it, it's not difficult, but the Lord shippers take it and beat people over the, head, <laughs> over the head with it to try to create again, this confusion. And, and really it it's works, righteous heresy because the Bible says the just shall live by faith. And we live by the faith of the son of God. So, you know, <laughs> It's all interwoven where Christ is the center and either either everything emanates out of him and from him to you and through you <laughs> or or it doesn't. And if it's not coming from Christ and through Christ, you're never going to arrive at it. If it's coming from men, you know, the, the, the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. You have to be born of the spirit. You have to be sealed by the spirit, filled with the spirit. To be able to see the things that are of the spirit. The carnal man cannot ingest the word of God. You got to be born again for that. And this is one of the reasons that, that they bring such leaven. Because I, I believe that a lot of these people <laughs> are not saved. And so that's, all, that's why all you get from them is the carnal understanding. Mm. That's all I have to say. 
Okay, thanks. Awesome. Um, well, I'll go next. I I want to answer it in in a, a form of a hmm, admonition, I guess. Um, one of the mistakes that we make, of course, we're we're here to to answer uh, any questions that come in. And so that's that's what uh, not only the format is of the program, but also we're told uh, to study, show yourself approved, always be ready with an answer for your faith, and so uh, we need to be ready to answer questions. But I, I also think that um, um, uh, it's very easy for people to. Um, be uh, allow themselves to always be on the defensive from the attacks of the lordship heretics. Uh, I, I watch so many programs where you have a debate uh, or a, a discussion between a lordshipper and a grace believer, and uh, the lordshipper normally is uh, posing all of these problem texts to the believer, uh, and the believer is always on the defensive, having to try to explain all the problem verses. And I, I think we make a big, big mistake in, in, in uh, doing that. We obviously we want to be uh, have answers, but at the same time, uh, we don't let we should not let them uh, control the agenda and the and the, the discussion. Uh, I, I think we're better off putting them on the defensive and and, and saying that uh, look, we have a lot of verses in the Bible that are absolutely explicit. That that's, that say something so plainly that it's it's it, there's no argument about the meaning, and, and so uh, if if I have a a verse that explicitly states you're saved by faith alone without any works required without any fruit, with, with, without any abiding or anything else, nothing else. And not only does the verse not include any of these other requirements, but the verse might even say that hey, you, if you add anything to it, you've ruined it. So we've, we've got all these verses that uh, say it's faith alone. And not only does it clear, but we could give you 100 or 200 or 300 verses to support this, this doctrine that we've, our conclusion. Uh, so uh, we need to make them uh, explain uh, our verses, our proof texts, instead of letting them put us on the defensive all the time, because the do, does the Bible have contradictions in it? Uh, is that what we're going to, uh, I mean, is it is saying on one hand that we're saved by faith alone, and then on, say, on the other hand, you've got to abide and, and produce fruit? These are uh, opposing views. They can't both be correct. So th th should I just get rid of the Bible and figure out something else to believe? If I'm going to believe the Bible and be a biblical Christian, then I have to first um Try to determine. Someone used the word hermeneutics, but that just means that the method of studying the Bible uh, and, and determining your doctrine. It's uh, we need to realize that one context, and I'm going to answer this verse with the context in a minute. But one is context, the immediate context, and then the broader context. The broader context is what does the Bible as a whole say about it? And so we uh, we got to make sure that we consider the context, but equally important is what verse what does the bible say explicitly about something and and, and then if it does say exp something that's absolutely explicit then uh, uh does it repeat it if it's explicit and repeats it over and over again that that's the the conclusion that we must come to and and uh, we should rest assured that that's the correct conclusion now uh this particular verse i've just looked at just off the top of my head here, I'm looking at the verses before and after, and it says in verse four, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, uh, no more can ye except ye abide in me. So it's, the, it's talking about bearing fruit as the subject, and if then the verse is following it, the key point is in verse eight, herein is my father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. So the, the, the context of the verses before and after is bearing fruit and being a disciple. It's not, it's not based upon your salvation that you bear fruit. It's based upon if you're a disciple, then you will bear fruit. If you're not bearing fruit, then you're not really being a disciple because a disciple is someone who is walking the walk 
and doing and a doer of the word, not only a hearer of the word. All right. Um, who's next? <laughs> I'll go. Mm -hmm. um, I'll say uh, certainly true. And you know, I'll, I'll confess this, you guys, my, my answers tend to be very short, even though like sometimes in my mind, I'll kind of rabbit trail on things and ponder things for a really long time. I just have a harder time doing it out loud on a show. <laughs> And so when I'm looking at this question, I'm like, okay, let me dig into this. Maybe there's something here I haven't seen. I'm sitting here asking myself all these questions as I'm looking at it. What I found myself doing is making it a lot more complicated than it actually is. And I love what Sister Lisa said about how it is very simple, like the gospel. It's very, very simple. And um, I do believe that it's talking about uh, saved, meaning abiding with Christ and the unsaved being cast into the fire and being useless pretty much so uh that is my answer and i just i loved what sister lisa said it just was very beautiful and simple thank you for sharing that and i it made me realize okay i'm am i trying to impress people with some like <laughs> some deep like um explanation of the scripture when it when it really is very very simple and um i just wow that was good sister lisa thank you mm -hmm. so that's my answer certainly true Okay. All right. Sister Angel, what do you say? Um, I'm trying to remember the phrasing of the question to figure out. If I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm, uh, to say that the, to refute the Lordship interpretation would be certainly true, right? So, yeah, um, certainly certainly true. And I think uh, Sister Lisa uh, pretty much set up my thoughts. I was kind of looking into the interlinear, uh, trying to figure out if there's um, a, 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 a better understanding of the words that were used, because I, I like to do that a lot. And I, at first I thought, that um, because the Greek word uh, in the verse is like mene, and it's similar to the Hebrew word, it, it's almost identical to the word um, uh, mene in Hebrew. I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's uh, uh, same spelling, um, which is to be numbered. Uh, and so I thought, you know, could it possibly be uh, referring to like being numbered in Christ rather than like, you know, kind of how we we would we would we would uh, look at the word abide or stay really be numbered, counted among. Um, but um, that didn't really pan out. But I think it, it's very simple. Like uh, like Jen said, I mean, we don't have a real choice once we're saved, whether that we abide with Christ because He abides with us. So I do. I think it has to be referring to um, those who are saved. And also, we don't have. I, I mean, I, I don't. I don't know anybody that's that that you know that could believe the Word of God and believe the gospel and never once in their entire life bear a single fruit. That's you know. And that's one of the things that's <laughs> that I mean, not that like because even even just repeating, uh, pro professing your faith, you know, that's bearing fruit. I mean, any uh, uh, the, God never specifies; He doesn't ever um, give us a categorical, uh, 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 you know, definition of, of how much fruit is counts as fruit or or how yeah. you know, like like the, that that's that. So you have to. Uh, and he would because he's exacting. And we saw that in the Old Testament. He showed exactly how precise he is and how detailed he is and how um, he makes everything uh, abundantly clear in, in, in a legalistic uh, sense um, in like the Mosaic laws and everything. And, and there's a reason for that. And that is, you know, so we would know that uh, when it comes to our salvation, he would never leave anything up in the air. He would never ha leave us to wonder, well, how much fruit is enough fruit? And does this count as fruit? And, you know, so I think that, um, you know, for, for, for one thing, just, uh, you know, professing the correct gospel uh, is, is fruit in and of itself. But also, um, you know, <laughs> obviously what we would hope, I mean, who knows? This? I'm sure there's a lot of people that believe that maybe never once went anybody to Christ. Uh, but um, I think that uh, I personally believe that when you're when you're a believer, we know that there's precious few of us, the people that uh, are placed in our lives. You know, they're, it, that, that's that's all uh, God's will. And it's a part of his plan. And so I have to believe that um, even even if we never actually win any even of our loved ones to Christ, um, but our attempt to do so, even even just uh, professing our faith to them. Um, 
that is a you know an incredible uh, part of God's plan and service to Him, um, and He will. Uh, I you know I do believe He will. Uh, when when it you know when it comes to the judgment, I mean I, these people will will know will be able to see um, uh, all of the all of the the things they were blind to, um, all of the times that God had tried to reach them, and I do believe that. Um, you know, even even uh, failed attempts to win people to Christ uh, are, you know, that's that's bearing fruit. Um, not to mention when you actually uh, do, you know, plant it, you know, plant seed um, successfully. So, um, you know, it, it's just silly because uh, like Luke says, we're always on the defensive, but we can easily turn that around to ask uh, to, to ask the Lord Shipper to uh, to explain exactly what counts as fruit and how much fruit and um to, to prove to us in, you know, with the verse that, uh, that their precise, uh, what, you know, I'm sure what they would say is repeated, you know, long-term improvement, you know, greater yield, you know, like they always try to try to uh, uh, figure out a way to, to basically um, measure salvation by the rate of improvement of the individual. And um, that's never, <laughs> that's never uh, shown in scripture. I mean, you know, we're basically, uh, it's kind of an either or thing, even when, ta- when you know, even when you, you know, you look at these verses in a fruit inspecting uh, context, which, you know, is not the correct context. But, um, you know, uh, the, the reason I believe that God kind of leaves it, uh, I mean, it's not really up in the air because it's either or. But, it, you know, it, 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 he leaves it up in the air because the only other, uh, you know, possible explanation would be that it's it's, you know, saved or lost. It's one or the other because we can't actually uh, use anything from the Bible to uh, try to quantify and measure um, a person's salvation by the the ratio of good to bad works. Um, you know, and uh, honestly, like you know, you get so uh, if you get, if you get really bogged down in it, I mean, you could even start trying to figure out like how many like uh, failures to do a good work, um, starts to actually add up to being bad works. You know, it's, it's so crazy because this is when I, when I first realized that I didn't know how to defend eternal security, even though I believed it, I didn't know how to defend it. These were the kind of things that I, you know, was immediately thinking of because I was hearing people, you know, really weasel their way in kind of a Pelagian, uh, uh, uh false gospel, but they, they'll say that, you know, the difference is yes, because, you know, most, you know, people will, will concede that they do still sin, but the difference is they don't commit willful sin. What you know, what they call willful sin, where, where they, you know, whatever that means. Um, because I'm pretty sure that uh, you know, e- even if you uh, uh, didn't premeditate the sin ahead of time, uh, it still counts as sin in God's book. So I don't, I, you know, I, I'm sure that he he wouldn't uh, he wouldn't fall for the idea that you did it by accident. Uh, but that's usually the, the, their little, the, you know, a, a little uh, uh, workaround that they try to they try to use to really uh, mess people's heads up. But um, if you know, it, uh, like everybody else has said too, um, this is something that is clearly you know metaphorical. But we have something you know so plainly stated, um, you know, in the New Testament. I mean, so there's so many plain verses that are they're, they're not up for any interpretation. There's not even metaphorical language used, but And, um, you know, some people might say that he was talking about physical salvation, but the point is, is who, who answered, you know, uh, he was answered in a, 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 a way that was salvific. So even if the questioner was intending it to be in a physical sense, how I'll be saved from the trouble that I'm about to get into, because it was the guard, you know, and the prisoners, uh, it, you know, it, the prisoners escaping was going to come back to him. And I believe the penalty was extremely harsh. I forget exactly what happened if, uh, if you know to a guard if they, if their prisoners escaped? I think they died. It was like, death. Even, yeah. just, right, it's right. Just so you know, generally speaking, it was death. Right, right, right. So, so even if the question he was asking in the sense of how, what do I do to be saved from my punishment, um, uh, he was answered in a, salvi- a clearly salvific context. He was saying, you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and I shall be saved in my house. Um, and that is so. Um, uh, no, nobody that wants to try to add, you know, a certain amount of fruits and, like I said, good to bad works ratio can um, possibly explain why any of that stuff was left out. I mean, really, like, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ enough and, you know, 
uh, abide in him and do good works and thou shalt be saved. You know, really, they would have left that out as such an important, important part of this of scripture, where you know the the question was asked and the and answered uh, very plainly. You know, the question that people debate round and round still. You know, in, in uh, so called Christianity, you know exactly what you know what is required for salvation, uh, because somehow they can all say the same thing: faith in Jesus Christ, and mean ten thousand different things when they <laughs> when they say it. So, uh, but I but I, I do I think that uh, this is one of those. Uh, uh, it, it, you know, it can be a, a stumbling block to people um, who who don't understand what the, you know, <laughs> what the the standard for eternal life is, which is absolute perfection. Um, and, um, you know, if people are really that confident in their own filthy rags works, yeah, they might look at that and say, yep, that he was talking about my fruit. He was talking about all the porn I stopped watching. He was talking about the cigarettes I stopped smoking. <laughs> That's what it means, you know? And then those of us who, uh, who do understand um, the incredible, uh, well, the impossibility of ever earning our salvation or justify, you know, or somehow retroactively earning it, which is this sort of this like twisted, you know, way a lot of people seem to be looking at it is that they get saved for free, but then they have to retroactively start learning it. Those of us who know better than that, I mean, we can really only see it as, as uh, uh, referring to the saved and the lost in this verse. So, uh, certainly false. True, certainly true. Sorry. <laughs> well, that's what I want to. I need to clarify from you and Angel about what your answer is. Basically, if you, you and Jen, you mean me and me and Jen, right? Sorry. No, sorry. no, you and uh, Lisa uh, on how to. I need to answer for Lisa because she can't answer the, the post your answer. Uh, but let me, say either, yeah. let me say something before I before I get a clear answer of what you're how you answered the poll question. Uh, everybody, we need to realize <laughs> if we believe this gospel that we were professing that no works or slash fruit is required for our salvation. Uh, and if we're convinced that we believe that and we believe that it's documented over and over again, clearly, uh, repeatedly in the, in the Bible. And then you come to a problem verse uh, uh, that where it seems to disagree with it. And then that, that's the verse that the Lord shippers want to use for to support their position. We have to either uh, say that, well, it, it disagrees with our, our premise, our, our doctrine. Uh, so that means that there's there's two different um, things being presented in the Bible. No, I, I don't think that's the case. Uh, so if that's the case, if that's not the case, then we have to realize that it can't possibly be talking about being saved in this uh, in this context. Because if it's talking about being saved, and, and then it's saying that without the fruit, you're not saved. And, and that is a completely... 180 degrees opposite of everything we profess to believe and teach. So it, it can't possibly mean that. Otherwise, we have a big mess. Uh, the Bible's a big mess if that's the case. Uh, so therefore, you have to search and try to figure out, well, what is it talking about? Sometimes you'll you come up with a, a clear, obvious answer. Uh, sometimes you can't be so sure because as... Uh, uh, Angel said, in this case, there's metaphorical language. Uh, in Proverbs, it's Proverbs. It's in, intended to be confusing. In the book of Revelation, it's apocryphal. It's supposed to be mysterious and secret. So there are some cases where we may not ever be able to have a clear uh, understanding. But what we should be able to say is absolutely can't be saying that a person is saved if they only if they produce fruit. It can't be saying that. So right. we have to have some other well, other answer. Brother yeah. Luke, can I mess you up for a second? Yeah. <laughs> can I mess up that beautiful thesis? Yeah. Um, it can if the fruit is Christ. And if the fruit I, is the witness exactly. of Christ. Exactly. Oh, it's about, that, so you, you put it perfectly into words what I was trying to think of uh, that. Yes. Because I was thinking about even answering the question, true or false. Right. And we're reading really the, dip, the, the, the question is how do we define abiding in Christ? So they go on, Lisa. Well, yeah, no, I was I was thinking that I meant to say that when uh, I had finished my question and sister. OK, Starling Sparrow, Jen. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, had started talking. I said, oh, I forgot to mention that the fruit is Christ and the witness of Christ and the bear. The bearing fruit is the witness of Christ and the true gospel. Yeah. So that that's it. 
That's awesome. <laughs> yep. That, yep. That is. And it was a, a much better, more succinct way of saying what I was trying to say. So, <laughs> uh, well, uh, the, the point I made in the, my first turn what, was that in the context here, it's talking about discipleship. If you look at verse eight. Uh, so uh, I think that is the context that uh, makes it make sense to me. Uh, but uh, um, I, I disagree with this, the conclusion that um, uh, if, if bearing fruit is Christ, I'm not sure if I'm expressing your position right, but if, uh, if that's the case, if it's um, Christ bearing fruit in you, then are we saying then that if we don't see any fruit from someone that they, they're not saved because if Christ is truly in them, they have to bear fruit? I don't. I would not agree with that position because uh, that would be. I would call that backloading works. But isn't and, discipleship no, 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 about no. spreading the gospel? So, so, so that's what I thought she was saying. Because so this is what I'm saying. That gospel. you're not gonna, you're not gonna have any other witness than the witness of Christ. That Christ Himself is the fruit. So, in other words, you're not gonna have. Oh, man. Uh oh, shoot! So there. Yeah. I hear you. Oh, uh, sorry. My Bluetooth disconnected. I'll try to speak up because I'm going to have to reconnect it in a second. But what I was trying to say was that the the fruit is is Christ in that you have been born again. This is the, the, the witness. And then you will bear witness to the truth, which is Christ. This is the fruit to know that that person is born again. I haven't met anyone who was, let me just say it in this regard, because I'm not talking about when people doubt. I'm talking about when you ask them, like you said, when you press in to find out whether or not they really know they're saved and they bear witness to the truth that they believe they've trusted in Jesus for his death, burial and resurrection for the payment of their sin. That is the fruit. This is what I'm talking about. I'm not talking anything to do with sin or works. I'm talking about Christ himself and the work of Christ, which is the truth about salvation is the fruit itself. Yeah, I get it. Uh, let me uh, uh, ask you then uh, how you want me to answer the question for you here. It says, uh, uh, true or false, John 15, 6 teaches that only those who continually abide in Christ and bear fruit will ultimately be saved. True or false? True. <laughs> um, uh, well, I, I ultimately be saved. I mean, they were saved when they believed. So it's like it is. It's hard. It's the way the question's worded is difficult. That's it's like right. a trick. It, it's like you can't answer. It's like a, a trick question, but you get the answer right, but you can't answer it in the, the way the question's phrased. It, it comes out as saying, sounding like you're, you're saying, um, unless you produce the Lordship's definition of fruit or, right. or, you know, or unless you abide in their definition of abiding that, right. that you, you won't be saved or you lose salvation. But I think what we're saying is that to abide in Christ, we're, we're defining the terms differently. And answering well, true. Then, then, then you would not disagree with the premise of the question. Then, basically, you say we're saying differently than what the questioner is proposing. The questioner yes. is proposing that if someone has not bearing fruit, they not they never got saved. That's what that's what they're saying that this verse is teaching. So now, how do you want me to answer the question for you, uh, Lisa? I'm sorry, when I got disconnected, I had to reconnect, so I missed uh, the last you, minute of your discussion oh, there. Okay. Um, the the question, question, could you the, repeat the, the question again so I can tell I, you I'm which trying way to, I'm trying to post. I'm trying to post your answer, and, and, and I need to know what your answer is. The way the question phrased. Am I muted? No. Okay. No. All right. Uh, I'm trying to post your answer, Lisa, so here's the question. John 15, 6 teaches that only those who continually abide in Christ and bear fruit will ultimately be saved. True or false? Uh, 
the continuum. I guess I'll have to change mine to right. false. I'm going to. I'm going to say leaning true because of the way that I described it. Right. In that Christ is the fruit and that we are abiding in him. We, we can't be lost because we've believed. Mm -hmm. We believe the truth. And that is the fruit. So, you know, it's, it's, it's I, I, yeah. some of these questions are oddly it's phrased confusing. and they end up, you know. So I'm saying leaning true. It's conditional as to what is meant by what the fruit is. Yeah. If they say the fruit yeah. is works, then no. If they say the fruit is Christ, then yes. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, leaning true, Brother Luke. So, leaning true. For you? No, for her. Uh, for Lisa. Let me see. Uh, I will, I'm sorry. I was answering it for uh, what Angel said. That's all right. Let me try try it again. Yeah, not not based on the works. Right. Yeah. Okay. You explain. Okay. okay. Leaning true. Leaning true. It is a complicated. The way okay. it's phrased is complicated. But you explain. Well, I don't. I don't see that uh, Christ is the fruit in the context that we're reading. Uh, the verses surrounding it. I don't see any reason to conclude that uh, Christ is the fruit that's uh, that is being referred to in this case. Can I ask you, Luke? So then, what would um. Like so, uh, you know, thrown in, you know, burned in the fire. What would, um, what would that look like in the context of discipleship? Because, like, right. that would describe your ministry. I, I, what I would connect that to is the bema seat. That the works are being burned up. They yes, have no they have no value. Okay. Yeah. So, see, I was thinking that. A, I was thinking that originally. As a disciple, thinking. as a disciple, any works you're doing, if you're not abiding in Christ, those works have no value. They'll be burned up. Um, so, but if you're abiding in Christ, of course, your works do have some value. But the point is, uh, I don't want to concede that if a person doesn't bear any fruit in their life, that then they never got saved. I wouldn't conclude that. And no, right. right, right. That was the thing that ultimately will ultimately be saved. That part, and if it had said, um, you know, that uh, if it had been phrased differently. It would have been easier to answer because the will ultimately be saved makes it sound like they, you know, that they won't find out till the end or something, you know, <laughs> that they're saved. So, all right. Anybody want to say more about this before we go to the next question? I do not. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think we're all eager to move on anyway. for this uh, uh, Brother Luke, before you get to the question, Jen, uh, Jen has something she wants to say real quick. Okay. Go yeah. Ahead. I just was going to say, I'm, my eyeballs are hurting and I'm falling asleep and I really don't want to be snoring into my mic. <laughs> So oh, okay. I'm, I'm going to hop out, but I didn't want to just uh, bounce without saying anything and disappear. <laughs> All right. So, so I wanted to make sure I said goodnight to you guys. Okay. Thanks for letting us know. Good night, Jen. Yeah. That's a good, good, good choice. Night. We've had more question. than a couple people do that accidentally. <laughs> <laughs> so good call. Uh, I love you guys. Y'all have a good night. Have fun. All right. Love good night. You too. Good night. Okay. All right. All right. Ben, ben uh, what's the next question? Excuse me. I haven't answered this one yet. Oh, I'm sorry, Ben. All this time and you never got to answer it? Nope. I'm sorry, Ben. Let's hear your answer. We were so eager to move on, and now we got to stay on it. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I, I, okay, I'll, I'll be brief, I, and I try to usually be. Um, well, before we uh, answer that, that 56, I think you need to back up the truck a little bit. Uh, we all do. Uh, well, first of all, I believe this uh, John 15 is uh refer because we you know none of us now nowadays except for maybe angel uh we we're not ag you know our culture is not agrarian like it was back then and so a lot of the common <laughs> practices with farming uh and things like that are were well understood by the by the people then that we just lost that knowledge not lost that knowledge but we as uh city slickers um don't um necessarily uh, think of this imme immediately uh, but again, uh, this ag agrarian culture, this stuff would have made a lot of sense to them back then. I don't think there would have been any mystery. And what Jesus is describing here is basically a practice of, it's called viticulture, V-I-T-I -I culture. Um, and it's basically uh, how you, you know, well, like for example, if I'm uh, growing a plant in my house and I see a, 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 a branch or a leaf starting to um, fall down and wither and uh, I, what I'll do is I'll lift it up and put it, try to, you know, brace it up and um so that it could grow and produce fruit but it but if it continues to you know die 
uh, there's not a whole lot I can do about it. It'll, it, you know, eventually it's going to wither and die. So I pull it out of the pot and, and I throw it away. And so uh, I think it's important to back this up here. So John 15, and by the way, I, I'm convinced too also that uh, each, each, each apostle had their own kind of like um, uh, language in some respect. So that uh, things that you're reading in John, uh, it, when John wrote this gospel, uh, you, they're expanded further uh, in, in his epistles. And so I believe, I'm totally convinced, there's not a doubt in my mind, that abide in the Bible simply means uh, intimacy, essentially. So, like if, again, First John, for example, it's a, it's a message to born-again believers about abiding in Christ, and abiding, abiding in the true doctrine, because they were, that church was being attacked by um, Gnosticism, an incipient form of Gnosticism, which taught that Christ didn't come in the flesh, uh, that light and good, our light and darkness, good and evil could could have fellowship with one another. And John roundly condemns that and says, no, Christ came in the flesh. He was God in the flesh. Uh, light and darkness have no have no uh, fellowship whatsoever. They're totally separate. Again, Gnosticism tried to make sense of of those kind of things. And he, he's refuting it. And again, in John, first John read over and over again, uh, and in John's epistle about abiding. And it says, for example, he who in first John, that he who loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Well, that doesn't mean that if you're a believer, you love the world, um, that you're you're insane. It just means within that respect, in, in that aspect of your life where you're loving the world, don't expect that that's coming from God, that that's coming from the world, that that's drawing you out. So, and it, I, I understand that, I and I totally agree that some of the stuff is difficult because you really have to dig in deep and understand that, that particular um, apostle's language, so to speak. But to understand this verse, I think you need to back it up to verse 1. Uh, in 15, so if I start with John 15, verse 1 says, I am the true vine. My, fa my father is the vine dresser. So again, that's viticulture. And he says, every branch in me. So first of all, this is a discipleship verse because you have to be in Christ to even bear fruit. So you have to be in him to even bear fruit to begin with. He says, so every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And if you look at that word, it takes away, it can also be translated as or lifts up. And I think that's exactly what it was, is it, it he's talked about being lifted up. Just like if I if I see a branch or, a, you know, a part of my plant that's starting to wither and die, what, what I'll do is I'll turn it around, make sure it's getting enough sunlight. I'll lift it up, prop it against the window so that it's not going to, uh, you know, wither and die, get um, smothered out by other leaves or branches. So I, I give it help, essentially. And I believe God does that through his chastening. So if he sees you're not growing, he starts chasing you. Say, hey, you're going on the wrong path here. He starts chasing you. Um, and chasing can feel like it's uh, a, like a burning sensation in some respects. Um, and then so again, he says he take, he lifts up every branch that bears fruit. He prunes. So again, that, I, I believe that's what exactly what he's saying here. Lifting up, he prunes it. He takes off the, the, uh, the parts that are uh, not productive. And so that that branch could be more productive. So if there's like some dead fruit on that branch, he'll pluck it off so that so that he'll lose that that branch will lose the weight. So it can again spring back up and uh, uh, but he try to help it out to help it grow. And so um, and he says that uh, that it may bear more fruit. But here's the here's the clincher right here. The verse three says, "You are already clean because of the word I spoken to you." So right there, that's telling you, I believe without a doubt that. If you're clean, that means you're born again. You, you, the only way you'd be clean is to be cleansed by the blood uh, and washed by the Spirit. And so he's telling them, he's these are words he's speaking to his disciples that, hey, you need to abide in my word. Uh, and in fact, you even see that expanded, uh, that thought expanded further in 1 John, where he says, anyone who doesn't have this doctrine and runs ahead uh, does not have the God, ha does not have the Father or the Son. He's not saying you're unsaved, but He's saying if you basically are drawn away by these Gnostics, you're not going to be growing. You're, you're, you're not, you're not, the, the, the abiding presence of God is not going to be with you in that respect. It's not, nothing to do with salvation, but it, it's just saying you're, you're, you're in error at that point and um, you, you run ahead. So uh, again, the, God, the Father and the Son are not with you in that respect. Um, but again, they're already clean. I, I guess I also see this as a clear parallel to the, um, Parable of the sower, where again the new life is when the the, the seed sprouts, that's new life. That's being born again. But whether you produce fruit 
is a totally totally dependent on uh, whether or not you continue to believe and you continue to continually to abide in God's word and, and allow it to grow you. Um, so again, he says, you already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. And then he basically says, yes, but if anyone who does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and withered and they got, they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Again, it's not talking about God grabbing them and throwing them into the fire. It's just, it's a discipleship. And if you're just, uh, if you're not an effective disciple, um, you're essentially useless to, to God and you're useless to others. And so, um, it's like, it's, it's similar to saying you're the salt of the, of the world. If you lose your saltiness, what good are you essentially? Um, and again, it, the burning is, uh, a, I, I believe it's temporal, temporal chastisement, potentially even leading to death. If you don't abide in Christ and, and you start, you know, going off in the world and even get to the point where you're starting to uh, become an antichrist essentially or talking against uh, Christ because that's what false teaching does you when you succumb to false teaching you believe what that what your false teachers are telling you and again first John talks about people were that were denying Christ they were antichrists and if you're overcome by them uh, if they're if you're captured by them you too will become an antichrist um, and so that's why you need to abide in the true vine and I believe again this is a, a, a viticulture that's what they did. They would take the leaves and throw them into the fire because they were useless. It's, it's a, it's not a picture of hell. It's a picture of temporal judgment, I believe. And some people have also mentioned that it, uh, I believe that you're going to be, you're just a burning in this, in this life where you may be taken out early, uh, or severely chastised. And also again, your worship will be burned up at the Bema, but I, I'm, I'm convinced, uh, you, you got when we read the Bible, we need to remember, keep in remembrance the precepts that were said said prior to this. And one of the first things he said prior to this was, "You're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you." These are the this that's basically word for word what he said to Peter when Peter refused uh, to allow Jesus to wash his feet. He says, "You're already clean," but he was clean only needs a bath, uh, but he is already clean. Except not all of you are clean. And he was referring to Judas because Judas never believed. So they were already clean, but as part of an ongoing abiding in Christ, um, we need to allow the word to uh, wash us continually, essentially. But positionally, we have, we're clean forever. But in this life, to continue to grow, we need to abide in the word. And I think that's all he's really saying. Can I respond to that? Sure. Beautiful. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I wish uh, you had gone first on this question. It would have uh, made a lot, I think, more sense to everybody. Uh, but I, I think that uh, the, the point about that they are saved, they're already clean, and then at the end he says it's talking about them being disciples. Uh, right. and, and then you're also, uh, uh, I, as you were beginning and talking about the language being used as the, the, the farming language and, and the actual growing of something and what uh, what happens to the plants and how it needs to be pruned. I, I recalled uh, Sister Renee's video on this scripture here, and it was she, she did make the same point uh, that I had forgotten that she had made. And I think that your conclusion there is really exact, exactly right. But we cannot conclude it's it's saying that what the lordshipers want us to think that uh, if a person doesn't produce fruit, they, that they were never saved. That's something we cannot accept. Right. Uh, anybody want to respond to what Ben said? Okay. All right. Let's go to the next question then. Okay. The next question is true or false. This is mine, so I guess I'll go last. Uh, true or false, the Pharisees and their disciples could cast out demons. Okay. Uh, all right. You wrote that one, Ben? Yes. Okay, so we have to go last. Uh, Sister Lisa, I, uh, it looks like you're there, but I don't see a picture. So are you, are you still with us? Sister Lisa? Huh, okay. Sister Angel, my you want to go first? Cutting in and out. Oh, okay. I'm here. Yeah. Can you can you want to answer um, this question? Yeah, I'm having some kind of delay right now. So, uh, you know what? Yeah. I'm not familiar with that. I'm not sure. So, my answer is going to be I don't know. All I right. don't recall. Then I'll right call now what you. the scripture said about that. I'll call that. on you again after we answer, and then see if what you want to respond after you heard the other answers. Then, okay. 
I guess, okay. there, is, I guess there is a about a five second delay there. Okay, Sister Angel, you want to go first? Um, so uh, I, I I'm kind of in the same boat with Lisa because I'm I'm, I'm thinking of like uh, conflicting uh, 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 you know things that I, I'm I'm recalling from scripture, but I will say that um, uh, to contend with a demon, you know, to contend with a demon without uh, without actually being known of Christ, we know could be uh, uh, particularly harmful to your health. So, uh, but I but then the the other thing is is that even as an unbeliever myself, you know, I've actually seen the name of Jesus um, uh, uh, cast out a demon. Well, now I won't say cast out. I will say it made, uh, you know, it, it vanquished it from the, the, you know, it was in the room. <laughs> and, um, and you know, as uh, I've, I've told the story before, um, I, you know, we, uh, we, you know, called on the name of Jesus and, uh, and said the Lord's prayer and uh, it was gone and it never did reappear. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, the Pharisees, though, they would not have appealed to the name of Jesus, um, and they would not have had the authority of Jesus Christ, nor would they have been known of him. Um, so I'm I, I, I almost certain that a scripture like specifically covers this, and I'm having a hard time remembering and also differentiating between, um, uh, uh, you know, casting out uh, like a, in a possessed person versus, you know, uh, so let's say, uh, you know, I think everybody gets sort of like a, a, a freebie, right? We talk, we hear a lot about people who called on the name of Jesus during sleep paralysis, right? And they, but that was the name of Jesus. Now, the Pharisees would never uh, uh, have called on the name of Jesus. So in that way, I don't see how they could have cast out demons, um, uh, you know, and that's what, that's what I'm kind of wondering is uh, that like Old Testament methodology for, uh, for vanquishing demons for, you know, that's, that's something that I'm, I'm drawing a blank on, but um, I will say though I know in the New Testament that we were specifically told that uh, that if we're not known of that, that if they were not known of Christ, that uh, they really had no protection or authority to uh, to go up you know head to head with a demon um, and a possessed person, and that they could be um, uh, you know gravely injured <laughs> as a result. So I'm gonna I'm just gonna say undecided because now I'm realizing I've never even asked myself that question as to like what. Was uh, what? How was this handled um, in the in the Old Testament? How did um, how did the the Jews handle it? Uh, you know, because I know that we now we 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 call on the name and authority of Jesus Christ to do it. But you know, before the name was uh, revealed, uh, I you know I'm I guess it would be I guess basically the same thing. They were calling on the the uh, you know the the Messiah. <laughs> but I, you know I'm I'm I really I can't believe I've never actually studied this. But um, uh, uh, I do know that, the, 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 at least at, during the time of Christ's ministry and the apostles, it wasn't working out too well for them <laughs> when they did that. So, um, uh, yeah, undecided. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. I'll go next because it won't take me long, long at all. Uh, 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 it, maybe someone can provide a scripture for me to uh, c contrary to this, but uh, I, I don't know of any scriptures that uh, say that the Pharisees ever did any uh, uh, healings or casting out demons and any any miracles. Obviously, we have the prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, there's record of that. But uh, I, I don't know of anybody in the New Testament before Jesus. Uh, um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the Gospel accounts, uh, I don't see any record there of uh, them ever doing it. Um, now I did see that um, TV show, the the, the chosen, uh, and they did have a, a scene in there. There was speculation. Of course, they took what they call in uh, literature uh, artistic license uh, to um, for the purpose of making the story uh, of uh, the liberty of, of uh, putting in things that are not in the Bible, but just speculating of what maybe it was going on, and they showed that Nicodemus had uh, was very respected among the uh, Pharisees. They called him the Pharisee of Pharisees in the show. And, and uh, he was try, uh, sent to try to uh, cast out a demon from Mary Magdalene. And uh, he failed. And then shortly after that, Jesus met Mary Magdalene and cast out the demon. And because the demon was gone, the other Pharisees 
they weren't aware that Jesus had done it. So they thought Nicodemus had done it. And they were all, you know, they brought him in to praise him. And and uh, he, he didn't even realize that he had done it. He didn't think he had done it, but he was happy that, hey, the demon's gone. So maybe I did cast cast her out. So that was the, how they represented it. But I, I really don't know anything in the Bible that would make me think that uh, they were casting out demons. Uh, Cripps, what do you say? Yeah, I, uh, uh, I agree. I agree with the way that you just uh, represented it. Um, I put leaning true just because there may be that one uh, special Pharisee that could do it. I, I don't know, but there isn't anything biblical. I, I don't think they trafficked in that sort of thing. I think they, in fact, I think that if a Pharisee came across a demon possessed person, they would walk to the other side of the road. I, I don't think they'd have anything to do with it. Uh, things to them were unclean and, and even people that weren't possessed just by their very nature, being a shepherd or anything like that, I, 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 I don't think that they would have had anything to do with it. And I don't think they had any power either. Uh, now, what complicates it, you know, is the verse that all the, all the people, the workers of iniquity that stand before God will say, didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we do all these? And, and, and Jesus doesn't say, well, no, you didn't. He doesn't argue that point. He argues, I never knew you. So that leads me to believe that there are some people uh, they're not Pharisees necessarily, but my point is they're unsaved people that are are doing uh, some uh, uh, spiritual things. Uh, and that's because uh, God or the uh, Holy Spirit can do whatever he wants. If if an unsaved person trying to cast out a demon and, and invoking the name of Jesus, I definitely believe that if Jesus wants that demon out of him, then the Holy Spirit can can, can do that. They don't get credit for that though. But anyway, back to the, back to the question. Um, I, I just, I put leaning false. I, it, it isn't a question that I, I feel like I can say certainly false, like some of the other ones, uh, just cause they're, I, I just don't know if there was one incident ever in the history of, uh, Pharisees where a uh, Pharisee got lucky, <laughs> but, uh, it, it seems unlikely to me. All right. Thanks. Okay, let me see. Angel, did you already answer this one? You, you, you said you didn't know, right? Yes, I went. Okay, and so Ben's left. Ben, go ahead. Yeah, Lisa said she was having problems. She may or may not be back um, based on her problems. Uh, I don't have a uh, – I put uh, leaning false, um, and I thought that was going to be controversial, um, mm -hmm. but apparently not. Um, oh. And it's just a question I've always had since day one because, like, it's like – it's weird because um, – well, let me back – explain this a little bit. Um because I because the reason I asked this is that um because Jesus said to after the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said to the Pharisees, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, which they were accusing him of doing, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore oh. they shall be your judges. So it's almost like he's saying uh, you know, some people interpret that and say, Okay, well, uh yes, that they, they were able to cast out demons. Uh, but I, I don't think that's actually what he was saying. I I'm I beginning to think that's not what he meant. Because what he, I think what I should also say too that Josephus and other uh, historians, historians, ancient historians will do have an accounts of Pharisees casting out demons, but he, uh, Josephus wasn't always the most reliable either. He did say, after all, that mandrakes uh, run scream when you pull their roots out, and I think that's where Harry Potter got it from. But um, mandrakes are a plant. And he said basically, if you when they pull them out, they scream like like people <laughs> it's, just, it's really bizarre but yeah he wasn't always the most uh uh reliable but um i kind of think when jesus said this to him he was trying to trap the pharisees just like they were trying to trap him um because you know in uh, another account in matthew um you know where they said uh they tried to trap uh christ and they said who by whose authority do you do this and he wouldn't answer them and unless they could answer uh, John, uh, the baptism of John, was it from God, from heaven or from men? And they 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 said, well, if we say from heaven, uh, they'll say, well, why didn't you believe in him? And if they say from men, then the they feared the multitude because the multitudes uh, liked uh, John the Baptist. So I think Christ might be trying to trap them just like they trapped him. Um, and again, that's kind of a law language. The language the law always traps you, um, and. And other evidence I, I would cite that they did, were not able to do it. So I think, in other words, Jesus, I wouldn't say he's being sarcastic. I wouldn't say he's being sarcastic, but he's being, 
he's uh, giving a rhetorical question, basically. Um, it's saying, well, it's an, it answers it two ways. He said, well, if I cast him out, then surely I'm, I don't have Beelzebub. Um, and, uh, and, and if your sons are casting him out, then you're saying that they're, they have the spirit of, of Beelzebub too. So, he, again, he's trying to uh, trap them uh, in their own uh, foolish thinking. And the other evidence I would cite is that he explicitly, Jesus explicitly gave the authority to 70 of disciples to cast out demons. Well, if, if any Joe Schmo could do it or the Pharisees could do it, why have why would Christ need to give anyone authority to do it? Um, the Pharisees also, uh, he says, you, you're the father, they were the father of their father, the devil. And so if they're aligned with Satan, uh, how could Satan, again, how can Satan's kingdom be divided? If they're aligned with Satan, how can they cast out demons? Uh, another point. Um, also, too, is that the uh, Christ's miracles, which I believe casting out demons was a part of miracles, um, that he did so that it would provide a witness of who he was. If anyone could just cast out demons, it wouldn't be much of a witness uh, that Christ was able to do it. Because uh, Christ even said, if I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. Um, but now that they have seen and also hated both me and my father, um, the... Uh, yeah, so let's see. Um, oh, the seven sons of Sceva, where they were beaten, beaten up. Uh, they, they were unable to do it. Um, and so, again, I, I, because it was the power, I, I think it was a, a witness of Christ's power that he uh, was manifesting the kingdom of God and the Holy Spirit, um, that I, I have really no other conclusion to reach other than that no one else could cast out demons. And I always think that that demon possession at that time uh, was unprecedented because, again, God kind of allowed it to happen to show the glory of God and to show that Christ was uh, who he said he was. So just something interesting. I'm not you know, certain on it, but I, I, all the evidence seems to suggest that they were not able to. I thought that was going to be controversial, but not. No. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, all right, uh, Lisa or Angel, um, now that we've all tried to answer it, uh, do you want to take another sh shot at it? Yes, actually, I had heck of time getting back in. Can you guys hear me okay? Because I I got booted off the phone now. My phone yeah. crashed. I had to come in on the computer. Thank God it's working so far. Yeah, I um, hear you. Great. You sound good. Okay. Uh, yes, while this booting stuff was going on, I was thinking about it, and I said, well, look, the, the the only Pharisees, I think you said Pharisees or Sadducees. Did you say both of them, Ben? Just, or just, I just one said, of the other? I, I just said Pharisees, but I, I, I okay. probably said Sadducees too. Okay. I would have said the only way they could do it is if they were really believers. <laughs> okay. And then the other was um, that, you know, I, Ben got on the whole, they accused Jesus of casting out devils by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. And I thought about that. I also thought about the seven sons of Sceva, uh, how you know, the, the devil piped up and said, Paul, we know, and Jesus, we know, but who are you? So I thought about all, all of that, and I, I, I arrived at it would be false, that they couldn't do it unless it was under the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, no, not by their own power, certainly not. That would be my answer. Yeah, and I, that's what I'm, you know, uh, I was trying, kind of trying to convey when I talk about like the freebies, right? Like how, you know, an unbeliever, if we were going to, you know, kind of just, if the thrust of the question wasn't could an unbeliever uh, cast out uh, demons, um, you know, uh, and I, I wouldn't say that they could cast out, uh, you know, a like a demon from a possessed person, but to cast them out of, of uh, like, for instance, uh, you know, if during an attack, if they were being attacked, um, you know, I have seen, I personally seen that happen, but, um, I, and I personally, I think this is like a, a, a tool, like an evangelistic tool almost that God uses where he allows demons to, um, to attack unbelievers, because in some cases that is really what, uh, when they see that the, you know, the name of Jesus actually saves them, uh, uh in the moment, uh, that is, uh, I mean, that's what happened to me. So, <laughs> I mean, it, it was a very powerful, uh, tool, uh, and I think it's a very powerful tool in, God, in God's arsenal. Um, but um, when it comes to the, the Pharisees, I mean, you know, uh, not I, you know the whole entire history of Pharisees. I don't believe they were all necessarily unbelievers. Um, but if they did not uh, understand uh, the name and authority of Jesus Christ, and um, exactly what you know, 
what the, the you know the Christ's earthly ministry was was teaching about um, uh, you know uh, casting out demons and all all of the things all of the examples that he set all the things that he taught the apostles to do um, and the these uh, spiritual gifts in in a, in a way where it wasn't just a, a one off with a with a with a certain prophet you know one at a time it um, it was you know it was supposed to be something that was uh, put into practice and replicated. You know, by 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 churches as the gospel spread, um, I, you know that was a new thing uh, in in a way that was like a uh, that this was a new model and, and a new precedent being set. Um, so I agree uh, that uh, unless it was sort of like it was God's will uh, that they that, you know that they were able to uh, and somehow they were appealing to uh, to their faith in God. Uh, I'm sh- you know I'm sure that they knew about demonic possession long before uh, Christ you know Christ's earthly ministry. Um, but, um, so, I mean, you know, I can imagine that there were situations where, where people were delivered, uh, of that, uh, by, uh, you know, believers, but, you know, we don't really have the methodology. I'm glad that's why I was drawing a blank because it wasn't ever discussed. And I couldn't believe that I, I had thought for sure that, you know, if, if it had ever been discussed in, you know, in an old Testament context, I, I would have zeroed in on that because it would have fascinated me. Um, so as yeah, that, that explains it. It really would, you know, I, I'm not just forgetting. So, um, but I agree. I, I, I guess in the context that most would read it and understand it, yeah, definitely false or, or most likely false, leaning false that, uh, you know, because who knows, what would they be, you know, what, no, what would they be appealing to? You know, like how, you know, it's very confusing to even try to imagine how they would do it, um, even as believers, even if they were um, actual, you know, believing Pharisees. Yeah. That's an interesting point there. There were some believing Pharisees uh, eventually, but uh, that that was the problem with that is that they were mostly the Judaizers also. <laughs> you know, they believed Jesus was the Messiah, but they didn't they didn't believe that he accomplished it all because they thought you had to keep practicing Judaism too. So uh, they were believers in a right. sense. In a sense, they were believers. I would say, except uh, for one of the greatest Pharisees. What's that? Right. Except for the one of the greatest Pharisees that ended up yeah. becoming a witness Our and a champion. writer of most of the New Testament. <laughs> Our, Our champion. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, man, you know what? I am blown away by the uh, time. I, I can't know. believe that. Uh, I I think we could try to answer another question, but this time tonight, I'm I'm wondering if my clock's off or something. I know. It's amazing. I've never seen the time fly by so fast on a Friday night. It's amazing. But uh, okay, let's let's move to another question and see if we can squeeze one more in. Okay, I think it's kind of an easy one, a good one to end with. Um, and it is true or false. You could tell if someone is saved based on the good they do for people. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Heather's question, by the way. Okay. Certainly false. Okay, Crips, you go first, right? Go yeah, ahead. That, well, it's an easy one. I, w- I won't take long. Uh, certainly false. Um, a lot of people do good. Uh, uh, now, uh, certain people would disagree with that. Uh, they they have the theory that uh, a person that doesn't have Christ doesn't have any good in them, and that may be true uh, internally, but there are people that do good things for other people. Now, their intent matters and all that, but it's still a good thing. I mean, if an unsafe person has a, a personal mission to go feed the homeless or something, is that not still a good thing? I mean, they may not be getting credit uh, from God for that uh, as far as uh, rewards are concerned because they're not even saved, but it's still a good thing. It doesn't mean that they're saved. It doesn't mean they're a believer. Um, I, I mean, the rich people, they do a lot of good for people, uh, philanthropy and things like that. Now, you could make the argument that they do that, you know, obviously for tax write-offs and things like that, or to look good in their community. I mean, charity, you know, the, oh, we're going to a big charity and we're all going to write a check, uh, happens all the time. Uh, but there is still some good done. Uh, it doesn't mean they're safe. No, we can't, as we said with the other question, uh, we can't go by the outward appearance of anyone. All we can do is go by their confession, and uh, only truly, I believe, only God knows whether a person is truly saved or not, uh, other than uh, what they confess. That's what we have to go by. So, certainly false. 
Uh, I'll go. Uh, cer certainly false. Uh, that's silly. Everybody knows that the only way you can really tell whether or not somebody is saved is how you know their tone of voice and how how calm they remain when they're speaking. We all know that that's the best measure of salvation. But no, of course not. Not not from how <laughs> not the good that they do for others. That's ridiculous. Uh, but no, in reality, no. It's it, that's false. I mean, we 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 know. Uh, <laughs> we were given plenty of examples throughout scripture of, uh, you know, I mean, I remember, you know, as an unbeliever, it drove me away because I didn't understand why, you know, uh, like people like Lot or, um, uh, you know, I, I, you know, honestly, I, there's plenty of reasons why you could see that King David was a, you know, was a good person. But, you know, when you're an unbeliever and you're trying to rail against God, it's easy to single out like how well, the injustice of calling you know, a murderer, you know, somehow he's better than, you know, Gandhi, who, you know, <laughs> whatever the, the examples, because, uh, because just because he believed, uh, that's, that's just totally arbitrary. But, um, but God gives us those examples for a reason, because, um, you know, uh, let's just say, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to stand before God and have to explain myself uh, uh, one day as to why I felt like I was in any position whatsoever to go around trying to determine the other people's salvation based on their behavior, good or bad, particularly when they profess the correct gospel. Um, now we can have our doubts privately. We can question perhaps, but even in that case, honestly, even privately, um, um, unless somebody starts to mess with the gospel profession itself, unless they, they start um, uh, uh, tweaking or adding to the cross uh, or, you know, taking away from it. Um, I feel very convicted about even trying to speculate as to whether they're safe. I feel that, if, that every time that I, I start going there, God um, rebukes me and uh, for my pride and my hypocrisy, like how dare I? You know, uh, I, I don't feel that that's something God wants us to do at all. I think it's a uh, uh, a very wicked thing to do, honestly, if somebody has the correct profession um, and they seem to understand the gospel. And, you know, uh, at, you know, that's when we start when we start trying to, to cast doubt on that based on based on how what we see of their behavior. You know, I, I think that that I, I, there's almost no way to, to, to do that without God turning that right back around on you. Um, because, uh, uh, it's, it's really, uh, it almost always, it has to come from a place of, of pride. It, it, you know, I mean, honestly, we can be curious. Now there are times where the one thing that I do, like I'll say when it comes to good or works or trying to judge salvation based on behavior, when, um, when people, who are, who are saved and they're, you know, and they're like, let's say they're trying to sow strife uh, among brethren or, you know, being real deceitful and kind of seeming to do what you would think Satan would, his really like his last resorts are, you know, when it comes to trying to mess with like strong saved believers, you know, he's got, he's, <laughs> there's not too much he can do. One of the best things he can do is try to sow discord and, and strife among a, a among a, a fellowship of believers. So, um, and, you know, and, and disciple ministry. And so sometimes I will admit that I, that, that the only time I've, I've gotten, and I still, I still think it's wrong because I still think that it's like, as, unless those people uh, have begun pre preaching a different gospel or something, um, I still don't think it, that, that God ever wants me to, uh, to assume the, uh, I don't know, like to, to assume the authority or, or you know, it, it, to, that I that I can sit there and actually question whether they're saved because that's taking the emphasis completely off of Christ um, and what he's done and placing it on, on the person. Um, but, you know, like I said, uh, typically, I, I, you know, typically a lot of that behavior does come with almost an inevitable, it seems like, <laughs> like, a, like a reflex where they also start to... Uh, to kind of uh, add to the cross or take away from it, I've noticed because it, and it might even and it might even just be because you know they are operating in a spirit of you know being a contrarian and they're bitter and so a lot of times they will uh, if they're also sowing discord they will try to find even yet more ways to separate themselves um, and put themselves above um, other you know other brethren 
Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're not saved. They're just totally operating in their pride and in their flesh and, uh, and shut off from God to where they're even, you know, uh, uh, eagerly participating in the things God said he hates, you know, above all things, you know, uh, sowing discord among the brethren. So but I brought that up just because that's like uh, when I was talking about how, how I feel like sternly rebuked when I, whenever I've started to wander into that territory of trying to get, you know, wonder about people's salvation based on what I can observe their behavior. I felt like I had to also be honest and admit that, you know, one area where, where I'm particularly tempted to do that a lot is when I see that kind of behavior, when I see people trying to start stir fights and tear, tear believers apart and uh, mess with the ministry uh, and, and be real deceitful like that. You know, I can't help it. I can't help it. But like I said, even in that case, uh, I feel that God has shown me that um, it, that that's not, you know, that's not what he wants. He doesn't want that from us at all. And it's really a violation in a lot of ways to do that, uh, especially when somebody does have the correct gospel. Uh, so. Well, can I respond to you, Sister Angel? Absolutely. Oh, I got to clap. <laughs> all, all I can say is amen to everything you said. That's my answer. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> oh, all right. Sister Lisa, what do you say? Okay. Um, let's see. The question was basically whether or not by works we can judge whether or not someone is saved. Was that basically it? True or false? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, then, you know, certainly false. Um, there's a whole lot of people that do a whole lot of good, and they would know Jesus from the man on the moon. Oh, did they go there? Okay, anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's my turn to go class. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so, no, certainly false. There's, uh, there's probably a lot of good people in hell, and that would uh, confuse the heaven out of everybody <laughs> that doesn't understand what salvation is about. And there's a lot of bad people in heaven. In fact, I don't know of any good people in heaven other than Jesus. So, <laughs> so it we say good. And remember, Jesus said when they said to him, good master, he said, why do you call me good? There is none good but God. So uh, it's certainly false. We can't look at works because there's a whole lot of folk in the Hall of Fame of Faith listed in Hebrews 11. That if we looked at them on their worst day, we would have said, no, no, they, they, they can't, they cannot be saved. But yet they're listed there. So it's, we know it's not about works. Uh, in the same way that you see people on their best day doing the best of works, you can't measure that. It's their profession of faith. It's who do they say Jesus is. And based on that, and whether or not they attest that they have placed their faith and trust in him and him alone for salvation that lets us know whether or not, at least by their profession, because only God knows the heart, that they're most likely, and I only say that based on somebody could try to use that to deceive because there are a lot of agents of Satan out there that know exactly what to say. They speak good Christianese. Mm -hmm. um, and they could deceive you. So that's why, you know, it's very important to always remember no man knows the heart but God. So certainly false. Uh, I don't I don't look at works and, and I also I and you know, unless somebody's burned me, meaning they've they've hurt me or damaged me in some way, I try to be very careful. And even if they've done that, I may not fellowship with them any longer because that's just being wise, especially if they've given me pause that I might get burned again. But uh, I also don't have the right to hold them to that forever either. And I'm cognizant of that. You know, somebody could have done something to you 20 years ago. It doesn't mean they're the same person today. You know, that things can change. People can change. So, you know, looking at their works as evidence of what's in their heart, that's not the best gauge, if at all, a gauge we should even use. I think we should pay attention to it. When people show you who they are, you should believe them. But at the same time, there are a lot of folk that 
Oh, it was. It's funny because one of the one of the most beautiful wordings, and I really go need to go pull it up. I think it was Title Seven out here in California, and I said this passage had to be written by a believer, because it's a passage that talks about how just because someone, and I'm paraphrasing it, I'm gonna go look it up because the language there is beautiful. It, it says just because someone didn't have a demonstration of faith. Let's say they started witnessing on their job. They've been there 15 years, but only in the last year did they start witnessing for Christ. That it didn't mean that they didn't have, that their, that their faith wasn't real. And it, I, I'm telling you, the way it's worded is just astonishing. I said a believer had to have written this. But the attestation can happen at any time. The conviction for them to stand up and declare Christ can happen anytime. It doesn't disannul that they have a sincerely held religious belief because they didn't do it 14 years prior, even though people may have known they were a Christian 14 years prior. Because, well, I think people wait for that and they're like, well, where's this and where is that? But it's in it's in God's timing for that person. And for, you know, when they catch fire, some people catch fire right away. Other people got a lot of baggage they got to get rid of. Other people, they're dealing with some other things. Maybe they have health issues. They have mental issues, whatever it is. But then there's this timing, and sometimes it'll blow your mind because it's like there's an acceleration that will even happen to them where they've been a believer for, you know, 15 years, and you didn't really see much of anything. And you may have even questioned, I don't know, are they really saved? I mean, they don't seem to be any fire there. But then you see little things, but then you're like, yeah, but there's not really any fire there. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's like they catch fire. It's like, who woke you up? You know, uh, so, you know, we can't gauge it. That's God serving. That's why I say before we open our mouth in criticism for people, it should be in prayer first, you know, <laughs> because you don't know what that person is going through. There's all kinds of battles a person can be going through. and We can't judge what they're going through or, the, or, or necessarily the fruit that we see and judge that person. There could be a whole lot going on that we're just, we're not privy to. We don't know. Yep. So that's why I say certainly uh, false. Yep. Okay. So it looks like everybody said certainly false. And that's what we would hope for. <laughs> uh, Brother Cripps, what's your answer? I answered. Well, you did. Okay. So yep. Angel, Lisa, and Cripps. Um, ben, that, that leaves you. Okay. Yeah, I, I everyone's answer is so excellent. I, there's really very little I can add to it. Um, I will say the, this, though. This is just an, uh, an observation. Again, don't take it the wrong way. Um, I will. I generally find that people who are confident in their position in Christ, they end up usually doing the most works. The people who are saying, oh, you should be doing works to prove your salvation, more than often than not, they have very little. They're not really doing any works at all because they're so ceased up with uh, making sure that they're holy and, and not, not uh, breaking God's law that um, they, they're so for it. The law puts your focus on yourself, whereas grace allows you to be free and you can, so you can uh, not have to worry about yourself. And so you can uh, serve others. And I, I, I find that inevitably people that are believe in tr uh, free grace, um, they actually are the ones doing the most works and the most profound works. Even if they're not constantly busy necessarily, um, they are doing works that are truly coming out of love. Like you can just tell because they'll they'll uh, you know look to accommodate or uh, assist a brother or sister in a very personal way, in, or in a way that you know they. It's obvious that they try to under they understand that person um, and really uh, you know have it's just very personal, you know. And so um, it's always the the people like us that are doing the most works. It's the people that always preach that you must have works their works are almost always non-existent um and even then they're filthy rags so okay yeah amen i i was content with saying amen to uh mr angel's answer but i say amen to everybody's answer so very good and, and I'm glad there was no dissent on that question. <laughs> that would have been embarrassing. <laughs> um, I wanted to add, like, because I feel like the best way to put it is whenever I have begun to to even wander into that direction, it's like I'm stepping on God's toes, right? Because um, 
Uh, he only gave me one way by which to assess, uh, uh, you know, like even it's like say I'm I'm trying to lead somebody to Christ, you know, and if they if they tell me that they believe after you know I've ministered to them and you know and they've you know uh, worked it out on their own time, you know, I mean I am to take that I mean, because you know Paul referred to the churches that he planted, you know, he was like little children, brothers and sisters, you know, um, and you know in the general. It didn't look like he was um, uh, feeling as though he could, he could, uh, ho- you know, kind of horn in on God's territory by saying, yeah, but I don't know about you. And, well, you've, you know, you've gotten in the flesh a little one, one too many times. You know, he didn't, he didn't, he, he would, he would uh, rebuke bad behavior. Uh, but he, you know, you didn't, you didn't see him. I mean, some people, I, I feel they would never address a, a room full of people that they called their church as brothers and sisters, honestly, because they're, 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 they're constantly uh, standing in doubt and uh, splitting hairs. So, so we, we see the, the, the stark difference between, um, uh, you know, the way Paul, uh, uh, you know, addressed people and behaved um, and people that would fruit inspect in any level and any, you know, in any way whatsoever. Um, and I think we're we're supposed to take Paul as an example, right? Um, so, uh, in terms of how we're you know uh, how we're to uh, conduct ourselves, we we don't have the supernatural. Uh, you know, we're not Jesus. Jesus could you know read the mind and heart in the split second. Um, so, in terms of uh, how we uh, uh, minister as as fallen you know humans and how we how we deal and make these uh, uh, assertions. Uh, regarding who's a brother and who's not, it's, I, I think the best example would be to, you know, is to follow uh, specifically uh, Paul, in my opinion, but, you know, actual uh, 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 fallen uh, men uh, in the form of apostles and stuff, because we, like I said, we're not Jesus. We don't have that that um, uh, ability to read the mind and the heart, so, uh, the, though I, apparently a lot of us uh, think that we do. <laughs> um, and um, I, so, uh, but that's, that's the biggest thing I think people should realize it's like that's strictly God's territory. He's given you one way by which to assert to discern. And if you find yourself, you know, uh, like questioning people's salvation, despite what they profess, and you don't feel the urging to go to them directly and tell them you're having these doubts, you can bet it's not from the Lord because it's not helping anybody, but your own ego to sit there in judgment of others. Um, but you don't even have the, uh, the concern or the boldness uh, uh, or the consideration to go to that person who you're thinking, maybe you're not even saved. Well, shouldn't you be prompted to go and administer to them and figure out where they're going wrong? Uh, and if you're not doing that and you're just standing back, you see, I've, I've done that. Uh, I do that all the time. Like I, 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 in terms of people, like say people I watch on YouTube and stuff who, um, who say that they're Christian, but I never hear what they're like. I never hear a clear gospel from them. I mean, you can ask Ben. He's he's, he's always surprised how many YouTubers that I I know or am in contact with. But it's because I, I know that they have they influence a lot of people. And so when they call themselves Christians and they have a, a messed up gospel or an incomplete gospel, um, I, I'm worried for them and I'm worried for those that they influence. So I will reach out to them. Um, I'm not just standing in judgment for my own benefit. Right. And it's not about their behavior ever. I've never I've never felt the need to do that to somebody who had the right gospel, but, uh, you know, had a bad temper. I've never felt like I needed to go uh, connect with them and uh, and make sure that they really understand the gospel. But um, but that's what I'm saying, though. I, I, for the most part, those who stand in judgment of other people's salvation, um, the uh, one really good way that they can tell whether that's that's you know that's what the Lord wants from them is whether or not they actually uh, reach out and tell the person that they're judging that they're judging them and that they have uh, that they have uh, uh, proven uh, to be lacking in their judgment and that you know perhaps they they need some uh, one-on-one you know uh, 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 you know coaching from uh, such a such a, a, a sterling example of humanity as themselves you know if they think that they're in the position to judge people's behavior um, uh, to to discern their salvation. So, um, but yeah, that, that's just something that I would add because I think it is human to, to wonder about these things, but a really good way to tell whether or not it's, uh, it's from the Lord is uh, what you do about it. And, and then that can also tell you what, what, what your real motive is, what, what itch is it scratching for you to judge other people. If, if you're just sitting there quietly or, you know, you never, you never talk about it, you never go to them, you never try to help them, um, but uh, you're just gossiping and stuff. Um, it makes you feel better about yourself, right? Mm-hmm. So, 
All right. Well, um, I guess we'll, uh, unless someone has more to say on this, uh, the last thing I would add is that uh, I, I would encourage everybody to really make an effort to, to not make these judgments uh, apart from they have the wrong confession of faith. Um, if you ask someone, are you certain you have eternal life and you're going to go to heaven and, and based on what, and they tell you so, an answer that you're, you're satisfied, they understand the gospel, they're, they're a believer, based on their answer, uh, then um, that, that should be uh, all that we require, rather than judging the works they do or the sin that they have or the, the, uh, the, the seriousness that they approach their Bible studies or anything else. Uh, so if we do that, now I've had some people I've dealt with over the years that uh, they make the right profession of faith, but the way I see they conduct, conduct themselves on YouTube is just very embarrassing. And it's, they're not really being an ambassador for Christ. And, uh, and so in my mind, I, I wonder how could a person um, act like that and really be saved? But I have to stop myself and keep that private. I, I don't want to publicly say I, I doubt their salvation because uh, they're, how could a real Christian do such horrible things? Um, so I, I have to really uh, restrain myself from, uh, even though we can't help the thoughts that come in our head and the, 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 uh, the, the concern we have, whether some, we think someone, well, maybe they're not really saved because of that, but let's, let's guard against that and let's try to nip that in the bud. And certainly let's not take it public where you make public uh, accusations against people uh, because uh, based upon anything other than their profession of faith. Everyone wants to see your t-shirt, brother Luke. Oh yeah, I, th I, th I did clearly. Show okay, I did show it earlier. It's uh, brainwashed, and the back of it is talking about Romans twelve two. I think be not conformed to this world, but have your mind renewed by the Holy Spirit. I'm paraphrasing it. Yeah, we had a couple of people ask they want you want you to show it more clearly. That's all. Yeah. Did they, did they get to see it? Yeah, I okay. think so. Yep. All right. Well, I guess it's time now to start our uh, closing remarks here. Uh, and Brother Cripps, since you, you've already got the floor, go ahead and go first. Yeah, it's great. Uh, great uh, fellowship as usual. And I'm uh, sorry, Jen, Jen had a, a long week this week and uh, she's been having headaches and stuff like that. I'm making uh, not excuses, but uh, reasons why she had to leave. Um, she's already asleep, so I went and checked on her. But uh um, really enjoyed it and I loved the questions. I'm glad everyone was able to join. Uh, when at the beginning, we didn't know if uh, Sister Lisa was going to be able to make it because of connection problems. We didn't know if Angel with her husband and, and kids and all that, whether she's going to be able to be here, but it, it worked out uh, well. Uh, so I hope everyone has a, a great weekend and join uh, when it gets to Sister Lisa. I'm sure she'll talk about uh, the broadcast uh uh for tomorrow night and uh, uh uh definitely come and listen to us over there it's a great time over there as well so thank you and uh i'll see most of you next friday all right great thanks all right um sister angel will you go next Yep, I, I am glad uh, that my little ones actually ended up going to sleep, so I was able to stay for the the whole remainder of the of the show. And yeah, um, awesome. I, I I'm gonna have to go back and listen because I heard that was some uh, great uh, great stuff I missed. So I'm gonna be definitely doing that. Um, as far as I know, we are not having a show tomorrow night. Is that oh. correct, Lisa? Yes, that's correct. We will oh, okay. Be, okay. No broadcast tomorrow night. It will be. Uh, never, never mind what I said then. <laughs> she, she said, "Oh, sorry, I didn't even hear it." Yeah, sorry. I, I just, uh, I always talk about the the show, and then um, I, I, I'm pretty sure she said she was going to be visiting family this weekend. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. But, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah so. You're right. My, it's my fault. It's my fault. I no, for, no, no, uh, no fault forgot. to be ascribed. Yeah, bad, okay. bad crypt. Bad yeah, crypt. bad crypt. <laughs> to the corner. I need you, chastisement. You, you sound like Ben. <laughs> oh, I love you, Ben. <laughs> but um, it was great being with you guys, and I'm really glad. I, I'm glad I did. Uh, I did uh, uh, just decide to take a risk and try to juggle it because I, I would have been quite lonely all weekend, not having a show tomorrow and not having participated tonight. 
But um, I love you all, and uh, I, you know, well, I'll definitely be looking forward to, to next week uh, with uh, bated breath because it's going to be, uh, a, you know, weird not having tomorrow's broadcast. But it's also healthy, and I'm so glad Lisa's going to be able to see her family. It's been quite a while, and uh, it's such a blessing to be able to have uh, uh, your family close enough to you where, you know, you can just drive to see them. Um, and it's also really beautiful to me that Lisa's family makes an effort to do that at an organized level. Um, regularly, which is something that uh, I know at least uh, uh, my family, as codependent as they are, they never uh, they, they never w went about their codependency um, in any type of beneficial way where they're like, you know what, we're going to get together no matter what. Nope, it's always been kind of just uh, scattered and all over the place. And I just think it's a wonderful example to have uh, to have, you know, planned family get togethers uh, regularly. And also, you know, at least, you know, maybe not all, but a great deal of Lisa's family, they are safe believers as well. And I believe her mother listens to the show. So. Yes, that is true. <laughs> yes. Everything you say is true. <laughs> Hi, mom. All right. But, uh, but that with it, I will, uh, I will let, I'll let you guys go. I mean, I'll be here, but I'm going to stop talking now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, stop talking and go. All right. Yeah, now the crickets to be quiet too. Sister Lisa, I'm going to save you for last so you, you can tell about your program tomorrow. But since you're not having one, go ahead. Right. And okay. Well, I I was poking around and I actually found that little small passage I wanted to share with you guys real quick from Title Seven out here in California. I know we get a a, a bad rap out here in Shaky, but uh, there are some still great and wonderful things about this state they haven't completely destroyed yet. <laughs> and this is one of them. It's about religious speech and protection. And it, it it's in the workplace because I had an issue where I was proselytizing at one employer, one former employer, and they tried to make a stink about it and tell me I couldn't do it. And I was like, oh, you're wrong. I'm going to go find out where my rights are. But I know I don't surrender the right to freedom of speech or my religious freedom when I come through those gates. So I went and found out what the law said. I went to ACLJ and shout out to them. They're one yeah. of the few Christian organizations out there fighting uh, yeah. against these tyrannical things they're trying to bring in against Christians. And they got lawsuits going right now uh, against various states for telling churches they couldn't sing and churches they couldn't do this or that, you know, but mosques and temples and kingdom halls and nations and all that stuff weren't told the same thing. But anyway. So, uh, number one in Title Seven here, uh, where I was reading, is it, uh, going to read from. It says, "Sincerely held religious belief is the passage there. The sincerity of religious belief is rarely at issue in Title Seven cases, although failure to act on a religious belief consistently may be considered evidence that the belief is not sincerely held. The fact." that the belief was only recently acquired does not render it an insincere one. An employer is not held to, a, excuse me, an employee is not held to a standard of conduct which would have discounted his beliefs based on the slightest perceived flaw in the consistency of his religious practice. Now, isn't it interesting that I even if this person was a secularist, that they were able to, to rightly conclude that, that that is indeed correct. And then you got Christians attacking one another when they don't see the fruit, when they want to run around and be fruit inspectors. It is, it's astonishing to me. But anyway, I just thought I'd share that with you guys. No, there will not be a broadcast tomorrow night. Uh, and Sister Angel had it right. Brother Cripps got it wrong. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be visiting my family. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll let we'll let Jen get him, sister. We'll, he she'll get him, and then right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we will resume next week uh, at eight p.m. Uh, Brother Fitz Houston has agreed to come back. Yes, and this time he's going to have his selections already pre-recorded, so we can just play them, and the audience can hear them. There won't be those issues. We we figured out it was something about when he clicked and went live that it just went haywire. Because before that, he wasn't like live with it, and it couldn't differentiate between his mic and the speaker. So it was, it was hard, messy. though. There was no getting yeah. him down. I <laughs> no, love that about it. There was no, no getting that, him down. <laughs> that, yes. that dude, I don't care what anyone says about him. That dude is awesome. I, I, Isn't I, he? I've been, listening, <laughs> oh, I've been listening to his uh, morning after the fact most times because uh, 
he, he does it really, really early, but I've watched several of them and, and left a couple of messages. He's, he's, uh, we're, we're supposed to get together and talk about some of the things. I haven't done that yet. It's uh, been a busy week, but, um, yeah, he's a, he's a great guy. And, uh, I didn't do this to mock him. I Sweet just did it, out, I did it out of fun, but, uh, Jen had heard it and I was, I was, uh, trying my best imitation of, mm. of, of him. Uh, I, I love the way he does the praise and worship. It's just so awesome. And it just tickles me too at the same time. So it's fun. Yeah. I'm going to make a meme with, in your face, devil. In your In face. Your face. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> Brother Luke, and to your audience out here tonight, if you haven't checked Great out God. Brother Fitz, F-I-T-Z Houston, praise and worship, you, you've you just got to do it. You've got to go check him out. He gets you fired up, and he does live broadcasts every day, and he just fires the people up with praise and worship for the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's awesome, so you need to check him out. It is delightful. And he was so it nice is. on the show. He like he just was like he went out of his way to like, include everybody and like mm -hmm. remember a little like what he, you know because he had never met or talked to most of us, and he like he, when one of us would chime in, he would he would pull out like something he'd recalled that we said or just very just such a just such a nice guy, real real. Uh, a real sweet guy and um, uh, very, very bold and, and it just spirit filled, you know, like he, he's somebody that I've been a lot of uh, unbelievers, unless it was actually talking right to their spirit, they wouldn't understand because right. it's all just, it's just that, you know, uh, he's just filled with uh, this, uh, this, this spirit of worship for God, which I, I just love that about him. And, uh, and it's something that he's just, he's so comfortable with expressing it. So even when we're having those technical difficulties, he wasn't, he didn't stop. He wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, he just, he just kept going. He made it work and it, it was so cool to watch that. Cause I, you know, I would have gotten hung up. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. So go check it out. And Brother Luke, I invite you to check it out. And on that note, I'll be quiet. And everybody have a wonderful weekend. God bless you all. You too. Thank uh, you. Well, you got me uh, interested. So and maybe you could post a link uh, to his channel in the chat room here so that everybody could uh, go look at it. Um, all right, Ben, uh, give us your uh, closing remarks, please. Uh uh, excellent. Uh, I heard a really great time tonight. A, a, lot of, a lot of great questions, super great answers. Um, and I do want to apologize for everyone um, on behalf of the entire panel, because it wasn't just my fault, because everyone was supposed to remind me. But uh, the, uh, I, the the responses, um, I didn't get a chance to read those. It's probably too much for to go back and read them now. But I, I will post them in the, uh, in the comment section. Um, and in the future, uh, again, we, we got to remind – I'm asking for a reminder if I forget – uh, before we move on to the next question, I want to make sure we read those. Um, also, too, yeah, Brother Fitz was so amazing. He reached out to me twice to email. He was so appreciative and um, just tickled to meet, meet us all. And uh, it, I, I let him know that, was, that the feeling was mutual. And I started uh, subscribe to him on YouTube and also on Instagram. He posts every day very uplifting um, uh, memes. And it's just, he, it's, yeah, he's just, he's really great. Love, love, I can't wait to uh fellowship with him again um but other than that uh, again i had a great uh great uh fellowship tonight and i'm glad everyone could make it I, i'm sad that um jen couldn't make it the whole time but um but we, I, we enjoyed the time we had with her and yes also too with uh, regards to your show next week lisa or this week it, it is kind of a nice little respite this week um because it gives me an opportunity to prepare for something uh if there's time next week so um that's really great awesome okay uh, well i guess the only thing i have left to say is um i I'm, I'm trying to pay attention much as i can to the comments in the chat room and i i just want to say that the the quality of the comments in the chat room in terms of the the thoughts that you're you're offering. Uh, I, I'm reading them. I'm sure a lot of people are reading them. Uh, I'd like to respond to them better uh, to acknowledge what you're saying. But I will just say that uh, uh, you you really have a lot of wonderful thoughts and input in the chat room that I, I appreciate. And uh, so, thank you for not only being here but but your participation. Um, all right, another fun fellowship Friday night. Uh, so uh, tomorrow night, you, you will not have the pleasure of uh, Sister Lisa's program. So I hope that maybe that makes you on Sunday just really uh, uh, yearning 
for fellowship. So don't don't forget to join us Sunday, uh, 5 p.m. Eastern time on the same channel for our, our Sunday service for the Church of the Eternally Secure. So thank you everybody for participating, everybody on the panel, everybody in the chat room, the whole congregation and everybody who's watching it, this program on the upload. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus. <laughs>